podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Hi, this is Leo Laporte, and this is my Tech Guy podcast. This show originally aired on the Premier Networks on Sunday, February 28th, 2021. This is episode 1,775. Enjoy. The Tech Guy podcast is brought to you by Nureva. Getting your audio ready for meetings back in the office? Well, Nureva Audio is designed for distancing. It automatically adapts to new room configurations, so you're ready for the new normal and whatever comes next. Learn more at Nureva.com slash twit. And by Uber for Business. Right now, for a limited time, you'll get a $50 voucher when you create your first vouchers campaign and spend $200. Go to Uber.com slash tech guy to learn more. Well, hey, 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 how are you today? Why, it's tech guy time. Yeah, yeah. This is, <laughs> I am the tech guy, your tech guy, the guy on the radio who talks tech. Uh, this is the show where we talk about computers, yeah, on the internet, home theater, digital photography coming up, Chris Marquardt, our photo guy, space, Rod Pyle, our space guy. Uh, you know, all that jazz, anything with a chip in it. 8888-ASK-LEO is the phone number. Car guy, Sam Samit coming up in about 20 minutes. We'll talk about car tech. See, all that stuff. 888-827-5536 if you want to join the conversation and talk about technology and the various ways it's changing our lives. 888 827 5536. Five, now, if you're outside the U.S., toll free in the U.S. and Canada, but if you're outside the U.S. Uh, or Canada, you could can still call. You just have to use Skype. We had three callers, international callers yesterday. I want to beat that record today. We had Canada, Canada, Mexico, and New Zealand. Maybe we can, uh, <laughs> maybe we can match that today. Just use Skype. It shouldn't cost you anything. Website, uh, that's important because I know you're busy. You're doing stuff today. It's a beautiful day. I hope you're out there enjoying the weather. And if you are, then um, perhaps you don't have a pen to hand. You hear something, uh, then you might want to uh, write it down. But you don't have to because James DeRuvo is doing it right now. As we speak, it all goes up at textguylabs.com. And that's free. That's nice. So you don't have to remember anything. You don't have to write anything down. It'll all be there for you after the fact. Techguylabs.com. We even put... Audio and video from the show after the fact up there. So if you miss a, you miss something or you want to hear it again, God knows why, you could do that. And there's no charge, no sign up, no fee. Techguylabs.com. You ever hear about NFTs? That's the hot topic these days. NFTs. I'm in Clubhouse, another hot place, right? Where people go and they talk about stuff and there's all these at first, I'm looking. I'm going, "What is? What are all? What are all these little conversations about NFTs? What are those?" Then I look it up, and it stands for non fungible tokens. What? <laughs> what is that? Non fungible tokens. Uh, it's a kind of. It's not cryptocurrency like Bitcoin, but it's kind of like it. I think my first experience with NFTs, although I didn't know it at the time was a site called CryptoKitties. You remember that? It's still around, by the way. CryptoKitties.co. So CryptoKitties uh, was a chance for you to spend some of your hard-earned Bitcoin, or dollars, I guess, if you want, but uh, pretty much people used crypto to do it, to buy cartoon cats. You wouldn't own a cat. There'd be no cat involved. You wouldn't even... You know, own a picture of a cat. You just own, you know, the digital copy of the cat. And yet, <laughs> you can make a lot of money on that because the cat values went up and down depending on who knows what. You can breed the cats and create new kinds of cats that might even be more valuable. It was uh, an investment opportunity. An investment opportunity. And I think some people made money on this. Probably for everybody who made a buck, Somebody lost a buck, because that's kind of how it works. That was my first non-fungible token. Lately, it's kind of going crazy. People, for instance, NBA highlights. I don't know how that even makes sense. It's called NBA Top Shot. 
And you might say, well, that's crazy, except that they had $217 million in sales, 76,000 buyers. <laughs> and the value in the last 30 days on uh, NBA Top Shot has gone up 610%. So it'd be a good investment. Be a good investment. A weird investment. <laughs> I don't, I, you, you don't, you don't own the player, you don't own the ball, you don't own the game. I don't even think you probably, the NBA probably owns the highlight itself. You just, you're buying, what are you buying? I mean, what do you buy when you buy a Fortnite costume? And yet, look at that, look at the uh, Epic Games, which makes the game Fortnite. They made $7 billion in 2019 on people buying non-fungible tokens, Fortnite costumes. There's crypto punks, 76 million, hash masks, 34 million, sorare, se I don't even know what these things are, seven and a half million, art blocks, I know that's art, <laughs> 5.2 million in the last, you know, in sales, in the, most cases in the last 30 days. NFT. <sighs> NBATopshot.com if you want to own the best moments from NBA history. What you own them? Do you really own them? NBA fans from around the world collecting Top Shot moments with over $200 million in U.S. US dollar sales across rookies, vets, and rising star players. I guess, you know, I grew up with baseball cards. That's probably no different, is it? I mean, you get a physical piece of cardboard, but, you know, it's not really worth anything. It's only worth what somebody will pay for it. When my kids were growing up, there were Beanie Babies. Remember those? Again, you get a stuffed animal, but if you really care about the value, you'd never open it. No, you leave the tag on. You don't cuddle it. That would get it dirty. You leave it in its pristine state because some days it's going to be worth millions. Except when they make that many Beanie Babies. <laughs> it kind of devalues it. I guess there's only one you know, NBA Top Shot highlight for any given moment in a game. Um, okay. So it's kind of like buying baseball cards. So I shouldn't knock it. Except they're completely digital. There's no physical element. Um, remember Pogs? That was a big hit a few years ago. My kids were also little. That's how I know about it. It was, it was milk bottle caps, except that uh, nobody had milk bottles anymore. <laughs> but they made the caps because people would buy them. Huh. I don't get it, but uh, it's happening. So I thought I'd tell you about it. Uh, you know, I know my job is to explain this stuff. Some things are inexplicable. Inexplicable. Um, I'm just looking at some of the other news and seeing which I don't want to say. Because most of it, I, who cares, right? I mentioned yesterday... This, the former CEO of Solar Winds. That's the company, the security company that so many big companies and government agencies use to protect themselves, except when they got hacked, it didn't protect them very well. In fact, it became a backdoor into their systems. And we know that so many were hacked, uh, including many U.S. departments like the Commerce Department and the military and Microsoft and others. And it turns out that it all began when an intern couple of years ago in 2017, this is according to a former CEO, uh, chose the password for their uh, their repository for updates there. It's called a GitHub repository for updates. And the intern, this is the story anyway, <laughs> I don't know if I believe it, chose, uh, what do you think of the password? This is again, to get into the source code for the updates that will be going out to the Department of Defense, Department of Commerce, big companies, 13,000 of them all over the world in their security software. The password, what do you think of this as a password? SolarWinds123. It's even worse than my old monkey123. At least my name isn't monkey. <laughs> yeah, of course SolarWinds123 got hacked, but it wasn't our fault. It was an intern. Okay, fine. Don't let, don't let your interns make up your passwords. That's the, that's the rule on that one. 8888. It never ceases to amaze. 
8888-ASK-LEO is my phone number. We can talk high tech. You and me, last day of February. I don't have to say that month name anymore. People mock me because I say February. I see an RU in there. I want to read it. I say, no, it's February. But there's an R there. What's that R doing there? I don't know. February, February, February. March is so much easier. Ladies and gentlemen, here she is, our phone angel, the unbreakable Kimmy Schaffer. Hello, Kimmy. Hello. I'm just going to take her in a little. Did you see her playing two pianos at one Alicia time? Alicia Keys. Oh, my God. Wow. And sang. That was pretty amazing. She is, I like her a lot. She's good. She's very good. She's very good. Yes. I like your young person's music. <laughs> Thank you, Professor Laura. She's not playing an oldie for you right now. I know. <laughs> she went She went skewed a little younger for this one. So, uh, Kimmy, it, yeah. what do you think of the password SolarWinds123? I think that person needed to be swiftly it was an intern. shown the door. The strange <laughs> thing is people, I mean, it was in 2017. People had been using it for years yeah. and no one said anything. That's that's incredible. Uh, well, it's a good password. I'm, I'm I can a, remember it. I'm a private citizen and I have stronger passwords than that. As they said in Spaceballs, <laughs> that's the kind of password you put on your luggage. Yep. Not on your secret code. Kim, who should I speak to? This could be funny. Let's just see what Lewis in uh, Phoenix, he's got a story for you. All right. <laughs> the jokes right. If it's themselves. not funny, can I come back and yeah, you yell can. at you? Yeah, you can. No, I would <laughs> You can never. swiftly show me the I would never. <laughs> I would never. Hello, Lewis in Phoenix. Thank you, Kim. Leo Laporte, the tech. If this isn't funny, you can laugh anyway. I will. I promise. <laughs> I, I do comedy across the country, and I have a website. Yeah. And uh, when people search for my website, I'm always number one. What's your, so you're a comedian? What's your website? Yeah. Uh, it's ArizonaLou.com. I think we've spoken. A-R-I-Z-O-N-A-L-O. -A yep, we have. ArizonaLou.com. I think we've spoken. They search for that. And then I get it forwards to ArizonaLouKiteBorder.com. Yep. Yep. Because that was my original site. That, that's fine. The problem is when people search with a Google search with Bing or or uh, Google, they get a Viagra set. <laughs> now what are they? What's the search? Okay. No, it's funny. <laughs> I'm not faking it. You, so uh, the URL that comes up. What is, what is the search term they're using though? Website. Yeah. What is the search term they're using? Do you know? Oh yeah. What are, it's, it's, what are they? What are they looking for? Arizona Lou or comedian or? Yeah, Arizona comedian or America's favorite old man. And my, <laughs> if you search for that, my URL comes up at the top. Yeah. Which is correct. Yeah. If you click on that link, and someone figured out. Uh, outside of my website, I think, how to end up at a Viagra ordering. <laughs> there, that sounds like what they're doing is uh, is um, camping out on your uh, on your website. Um, so the first thing we want to do is look at what search terms people use on a regular basis to find you. Yep. And you can do that on the, what they call the Google Search Console. Mm -hmm. So uh, search.google.com. You type in, and I'm going to do that right now. I have a, actually already logged in, so it has all of my sites. But let me let me put in, you think it's yeah. the Arizona Lou that's doing that? I don't think so. Now, did you search for Arizona Lou? I did, and or? I did not get, I got Arizona Lou Kite Border. Let me... Let me click the link and see what I get. Link, You're saying that's going to take me... Oh, wait a minute. Is this a paid advertisement that you're seeing? No, I have no advertising. You know what? I know, but maybe somebody bought Arizona, Lou. I'm clicking on it. About Oh, it went right to uh, Viagra. Well, of course. <laughs> you need it. <laughs> it must have known. Okay, so this is going to your About page. So let me see if I go directly to the About page. I think your site has been hacked, my friend. But I notice you're not using uh, SSH. When I type in, yeah, so that's one thing. You Who's hosting your site for you? Uh, GoDaddy. 
Okay. And their solution was for me to pay $600 for the next two years. And I do this as nonprofit. And I, yeah, you can't, you don't want to pay for it. Um, yeah. Maybe move off GoDaddy. Now, one of the things that happens, wow, you were a heck of a boxer. Look at that. My goodness. <laughs> wow. Um, so uh, I like your high school senior picture, too. That's cute. That's oh, really cute. Yeah. Good looking fella. So um, I am <laughs> well, thinking. Changed, hasn't it? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I went if I went directly to Arizona Luke Kiteboarder.com slash about dot HTML, it's fine. Mm hmm. ArizonaLoader.com. You're right. Yeah. Yep. But um, weird. I get that on. Well, here's the really weird thing. I got that online pharmacy favicon when I. This is very strange. How are they and doing? It varies that? from one pharmacy to the other sometimes. Oh, interesting. And someone I someone I saw somewhere that. The thing, uh, someone figured out a way to start a blog and tell Google that there's more new content for my website. Uh, no, I think your site has been modified. I don't. I think that that wouldn't happen unless you're. Well, there's a couple of ways it could happen. It could happen with a DNS. Do you know how to do DNS? Uh, not much. I would look at your uh, DNS record at GoDaddy and make sure there's nothing been added there. But the fact that they were able to do this tells me they've compromised you in some way. Either yeah, your GoDaddy password or more like most likely your Go. Try changing your GoDaddy password. Okay. It's a very it's a very odd uh, thing. It is certainly cause for concern. Um. Because I don't exist. Yeah. Well. Yeah, it's not good. I mean, I was able to type it in and cut and paste it in, but when I click the search link, it doesn't. It goes to this other one, which is very puzzling to me. I'm gonna have to. Now, when you click the search link, the correct URL comes up initially, then it switches. I don't know if you noticed that or not. Yeah, no, I see it. Uh, yeah. And it what it. <laughs> Yeah. I re-uploaded from from my clean source on my on, on my computer. I re-uploaded uh, the pages, not all of them, but the main. Here's page. why. Here's why I'm telling you it's not uh, Google doing this because it works in Bing as well. Yes. <laughs> so that's well, Microsoft's Google. Go. So yeah. So uh, it is not something that Google knows or has it's something with your site so there's two ways this could happen there could be a change in your dns record so you got to look at that or there could be something on the web page that sends it i i'll do a little digging i can probably uh, figure this out if i look at it but uh yeah you want to fix that it's malicious leo laporte the tech guy um that's a really interesting bug and it, it, I think it's it's cause for concern on your part, Lou, because that means someone's compromised you. Let me just do a little quickly. I'll go to the a command line and do a dig, and see what see what's happening when I dig it, man. Dig is. There is any way we can get the the uh, rogue websites in trouble? Have their I can license yay. No, um, I don't think so. This. No, first of all, they're probably not in Canada. <laughs> so I'm going to dig <laughs> Arizona Lou.com slash about dot HTML. That's the, that's the URL that does this. Is, it, is that the only page, the about page that does this? Oh no! Any any page. In fact, I have a search box on my website. It does that too. Upper left, and it does it too. And like I said, I uploaded a clean my I every every bit of code on my website. I've coded myself, so I know what's on there. And nobody's gotten onto my computer to change things for when well, I don't re know. That's the problem. You don't know. Because if uh, if people got in, um, they might have um, modified it without your knowledge. 
I think it's most likely a DNS issue. Mm-hmm. So Hawaii Cop is saying this is not unusual. You have to add a security fix at GoDaddy. So uh, they're saying GoDaddy is the source of this. So let me let me just see if I can figure out what's going on. This is very this is bugging me now. Hey Sam. <laughs> hey Leo. I'll be with you in a sec. Go, Daddy. Can Sam hear me? Yes, he can. Hey, yep, Sam. I can hear hi. I love everything you do there. <laughs> oh, thank you, Lou. <laughs> Sam, meet Lou. Hi, Lou. Hi. Look at my website and laugh at, at, at well, you're supposed to laugh at my comedy, not my <laughs> link to Viagra. <laughs> yeah, that's, so that's, um, there is a, uh, <laughs> there is a GoDaddy page. Are there malicious redirects on my website? <laughs> uh, they say... Yeah. Google search results sends to Viagra site. Look at that. ScooterX has... We'll put these in the show notes so that you can uh, look at them in more detail, Lou. Okay, uh, yeah, I appreciate it. Yeah. Google search results sends to Viagra site. I built a web. It looks like the site had been infected. I don't know if that's true. Um, SEO spam. You can use GoDaddy Site Lock to clean your site. So I guess this, the recommendation here, Lou, is you go Google GoDaddy Site Lock. Oh, yeah, this is the one where they charge you six bucks. Thank you, GoDaddy. Well, six bucks isn't as bad as 150 bucks a year. Plus SSL for another hundred fifty bucks a year. Yeah, I don't like GoDaddy. Uh, you can keep your domain registered at GoDaddy and host it somewhere else, which I would do. I've never thought mm-hmm. that this is this does seem like something GoDaddy is subject to. What do you say? Let's talk about Nareva. You uh, they sponsored the podcast today. Thank you, Nareva, uh, and I think they're a great solution for anybody. That's ready to get back to work, uh, but a little nervous about going into the conference room. There's a lot of reasons to be nervous, but we're starting to do that, classrooms and so forth. The issue really is you want to continue to social distance, wear masks. You can't say sit like you used to. And you don't want to have microphones in front of everybody because then you got to sanitize them. Nareva is a perfect solution. It's kind of like a sound bar, but it's a microphone. It goes up on the wall. It's not a beam forming system. Those are complicated. They have to be calibrated regularly. It's not a tabletop system. It goes on the wall and it's using the patented, in fact, they've got four patents, microphone mist technology. In effect, it's computational audio. We talk a lot about how, how phones now do computational photography. It's audio. The software though, fills the room with thousands of virtual microphones. So you get full room coverage. doesn't matter where people are placed. doesn't matter where they're facing. They don't have to face the microphone. They can sit socially distanced comfortably and still be absolutely well heard. No technicians. You can install it yourself. It's Of course, it's microphone and speaker system, and it's perfect for teleconferencing. Nareva products have won many awards. They just won the top new technology award at ISC 2020. That was for their HDL 200 system. Uh, it, no matter what size your room, what your needs are, the number of speakers, they have a full line of systems for small, medium, and large spaces. They use them at HubSpot. In fact, Jimmy Yan, who's their principal collaboration engineer, I saw this on the website, says, we were so impressed with the sound quality and that's really ultimately what you're looking at, but also ease of install and ease of use. And they use the HDL 300. It was a no-brainer for us to adopt it. If you're going back to work, you're having those conference calls, you're going back to school, you're having the Zoom meetings, you got to have Nureva, N-U-R-E-V-A. It's a simple, cost-effective way to let your team's distance and meanings still act and converse naturally, but hear every word. Nureva.com slash twit. Designed for distancing, N-U-R-E-V-A dot com slash twit. This is so brilliant. Such a clever idea. 
It's basically computational audio. Nareva, we thank you for uh, supporting the Tech Guy podcast. And thank you for supporting the podcast. If you have need for something like this, to go to nareva.com slash twit. That'll let them know you saw it here. Nareva, it's time for our low rider, Mr. Sam Abul Samet. He is our car guy. Principal researcher at Guidehouse Insights, where he writes about cars all day long. He also talks about them all night long at his Wheel Bearings podcast, wheelbearings.media. We've got him in a rare gap in his schedule to uh, talk to us about cars. Hi, Sam. <laughs> hey, Leo. Actually, yeah, we just uh, just finished wrapping up uh, recording another Wheel Bearings podcast uh, nice. about a half hour ago. Nice. So, so yeah. tell, tell me what's going on in uh, the car world. Oh, there's all kinds of stuff. Uh, but I wanted to talk today about all-wheel drive versus four-wheel drive. Oh, um, now I have all-wheel drive, I think, on my you, Ford Mustang Mach-E because it's got two motors, one in the rear axle, one in the front you, axle, right? You do. And there are... Uh, there are similarities and differences between the two. Um, you know, so most modern vehicles, you know, especially like crossovers and, and a lot of cars, um, you know, a lot of them offer all-wheel drive as an option. But all-wheel drive is actually something quite different from four-wheel drive. If you look at you know, a lot of trucks and more traditional type SUVs, you'll find that they offer four-wheel drive. And Seems like the two would be interchangeable. Yeah, but they're not. all my wheels. There's only four. Sounds like four wheels. <laughs> That's right. Mm -hmm. So the the distinction between the two is all wheel drive vehicles uh, are and and there are some some variations on this, but you know among traditional internal combustion vehicles in particular, all wheel drive usually refers to vehicles that are primarily two wheel drive, either front wheel drive or rear wheel drive. And then they have a system to redirect some of the engine torque to the other axle when there's slip on the drive wheels. So, you know, um, if you're looking at the, the stream right now, you'll see over my shoulder a picture of a Ford Escape. Yes. And the Ford Escape is available with all wheel drive. So it's normally front wheel drive. And when you start getting some wheel slip on the, uh, you know, some the wheels start to spin on the front axle, what happens is there's a, a mechanism. It's usually either some sort of viscous coupling, a fluid coupling, or an electronically controlled clutch. In the case of the, the Escape, it's an electronically controlled clutch that'll send about 10 to 15% of the torque to the rear wheels to give you some extra traction. And it's a it's a part time system, and it's uh, it's automatically controlled. There's no there's no user intervention with it. Four wheel drive, on the other hand, is typically it, it it's a system where it splits all the the torque e more or less evenly between the the front and rear axles, and uh, it's so it's always driving all the all the wheels. So even though it's not all-wheel drive, it's always driving all the wheels. So you know, an example of that is the Ford Bronco Sport. The Bronco Sport is actually based on the same platform as the Escape, but it has four-wheel drive. And what you can do in the Bronco Sport is you can do things like lock the center differential. So a differential controls the the split between you know either between the axles or um, you know across the the wheels on an axle. So you don't get the, the wheel skidding. So uh, with four-wheel drive, you can drive all four wheels, you know, send 25% of the torque to each of the four wheels. So you can, in really extreme conditions, you can get more traction than would be possible with just all-wheel drive. So I shouldn't go up in the snow in my Ford because I have all-wheel no, drive. Oh. Well, you, you can't, but... <laughs> what, yeah, what does this mean? I don't know the differential from the... Yeah, different so, engines. Uh, so, what does this mean to me in terms of how I drive? I guess I should ask. So, um, regardless of whether you have four wheel drive or all wheel drive, yeah, you know, one of the things we've talked about in the past is your tires. Your tires are ultimately the weak link in this whole chain between the vehicle and the road, or in some cases, the lack of a road. So, for off road vehicles, you know, typically they're going to be equipped with four wheel drive, um, but even even with four wheel drive, without the right tires, you still may not get any traction. You know, in the example here, the the Ford Bronco Sport in the picture, I got into some deep snow that was too deep. You know, for you know, even for the the tires that were on it, which were you know these all terrain tires, but you know it was about eight inch deep snow, and I was trying to climb up a, a bit of a slope and. 
basically couldn't go anywhere. So instead of spinning just the front wheels or spinning just the rear wheels, I was spinning all four wheels and not going anywhere except kind of sideways really more than anything else because the the tires didn't have any grip. So this was, you know, we've talked previously about using winter tires. You know, I didn't have, you know, real winter tires on this thing. And I found the the limits of what it was capable of, even though I've driven the Bronco Sport before, you know, on dirt and, you know, uh, over, you know, rough terrain where it, it was great with the tires that were on there, uh, you know, when it was dry or even a little bit muddy. But when you get into some deep stuff and you don't have enough traction, even four wheel drive is not going to help you. And so you got to be careful if you're driving, whether with all wheel drive or four wheel drive, that, um, you know, you can, if you're not, if you're not careful when you're using those kinds of vehicles, they can't create traction where there isn't any. And so what can end up happening is you can end up driving too fast in bad conditions and just get yourself deeper into trouble than you would with a two wheel drive vehicle. Hmm. It's so confusing to me. I've seen you on four wheel <laughs> drives. You have a big plunger that you pull up to engage the four wheel drive. Is that just like on, sometimes on on older on older. some older Nowadays, vehicles so they they'll have a yeah yeah they'll have a, a manual you know there'll be a separate shifter so you'll have a shifter for the transmission and a right. second shifter right. for four wheel drive or four wheel drive low range you know which just gives you more reduction, uh, more, more gear reduction, uh, for crawling, you know, if you're like going through a Canyon or something like that, um, on most modern four wheel drive vehicles there that's electronically controlled. So there's just a switch on the, the console, like they, like what they, uh, the Bronco sport has, you know, so, um, you, you, there's still, you, you know, the tires ultimately are still the limiting factor, no matter how smart the electronics are in the vehicle. Okay. Whew. So, I don't think I could even – do electric vehicles ever have all-wheel drive? They don't have a differential. Yeah. Oh, they do. Well, you, you've, okay. got, you've got all-wheel drive. I mean uh, four-wheel you know, drive. Four, so you see, I'm already confused. <laughs> four-wheel drive. Can they have four-wheel yeah. drive? Yeah. Well, be, because you know, in an EV, because it's all controlled through software, you know, the distribution of the, the torque to the, the wheels, um, you could actually – do the make the software behave like a four wheel drive vehicle. So oh, when the GMC Hummer software. EV comes out, oh, yeah. So when oh. the GMC Hummer EV comes out later this year, or the Rivian, um, that's going to be, you know, they're going to have four wheel drive style capability. So it can behave like a four wheel drive vehicle, get you traction to all, you know, sp you know, driving all four wheels with equal torque or or any distribution of torque you want. So um, it's it's completely software defined in that case. Interesting. Interesting. I don't understand. So there's some way that it still has individual control of each wheel somehow. Yeah. Yeah. So there, it uses a mix of different things. So you can, you know, even with, you know, in your case, you've got two motors, one in the front, one in the rear. There's right. a differential at each, each oh, axle. Okay. And we'll talk right. about differentials another time, but they can be electronically controlled. Um, or you can actually use the brakes to, so if, if the wheel on one side uh, of the axle is starting to spin, you can apply a little bit of brake to it, and that'll send torque over to the other side where you might have more traction. Very interesting. Yeah. <sighs> Who needs four-wheel drive? Uh, you know, if you live in um, in in places, if uh, I never you know, go off-road, have, have do I need four-wheel drive? Probably not. Okay. Um, but you know, for, for, you know, a lot of people do like to go off road, um, you know, or, you know, if you're heading out into the, the wilderness, either to drive on a trail or, um, you know, like here in Michigan, you know, a lot of people head up to Northern Michigan in the summertime or in the wintertime, uh, and having four wheel drive to get to a trailhead, uh, you know, to, you know, then take your, take your mountain bikes out and then go mountain biking, things like that, you know, can be very handy for that. Or I could have bought the Ford Mach-E GT edition, which has four motors, one per wheel. No, it's wheel. only two motors. Oh, crud. <laughs> <laughs> but Good. they're bigger motors. Because it was way expensive. I didn't want it. Yeah. Sam Abul Samad. Listen to Wheel Bearings at wheelbearings.media. Thank you, Sam. Thank you, Leo. <laughs> yeah, that, was, that went woof, right up right up in my head. I had no idea what you're talking about. I'm just going to pretend... I have four-wheel drive, even though I only have all-wheel drive. I understand. It's about controlling individual tires.
Yeah. yeah. And um, I'll have to, I'll, I'll do another segment maybe next week on, uh, on differentials and what those do and how they work. <laughs> yeah. Cause that's where you lost me. As soon as you said differential, I went, I know that's that lump. Yeah. <laughs> but I don't know what it does. Well, it's, it's, it's what, <laughs> you know, when, when you, when you go around a corner, the outer wheels on the car have, have to go to farther. At a different, yeah. And yeah, so yeah, what yeah. the differential does is it allows that difference in wheel speed across the axle. Right. Cause if you, so you, if have you to don't do have that on an electric car, you have to do that in software. Is that right? Well, an electric car still has a differential in it. Oh, it does. A, a physical yeah, differential. Still oh, okay. A physical differential. Oh, okay. But then you can you can control that. You can add clutch packs to that to control it, to uh, limit the amount of slip it allows. There's, uh, there's a lot of things you can do with it. I'm not a car guy. I think you guessed that. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I like electric cars. They're very simple. Yeah. You push the pedal, they go. <laughs> you let go of the pedal, Simple they in stop. some ways, more complex in other Probably ways. Probably under got the a lot hood. Yeah. Got a lot of software in there. Yeah, there's a lot of software. I understand software, see. I don't that, I don't have yeah. a problem with that. How's things going? Beautiful weather going, yet, or are you still cold? Um, last couple of days were really nice. It was nice. Uh, like 50 degrees the last couple of days. Nice. I you know, went out just waiting for uh, for some rain to wash away the salt before I can pull the Miata out. Yeah. We're, we're supposed to get some rest, rain later rest today. Rest that thing out. That's uh, that's a classic. Nope. Yeah. yeah. Well, I'm still loving my uh, Mach-E. It's, uh, it's really Glad great. Glad to hear that. Yeah. Um, haven't had any problems with it. Well, today I did. It didn't recognize my phone key, so I had to enter my master password to drive. Oh. Which is weird. Yeah, it's funny because CarPlay was working, so I know it saw the phone. It's just some. Yeah, well, it's, it's a different mechanism. Right. You know, yeah. for, for good it's reason. using the, the Wi Fi and the regular Bluetooth for, for the CarPlay. It's a, it's a Wi Fi thing, probably, huh? Well, it's, I think it uses Bluetooth to do the initial connection and authentication uh, and then connects Wi well, Wi Fi direct to actually stream the data. Um, yeah. over the Wi-Fi. Yeah, because there's a lot of data. So you got more more bandwidth there than you do with Bluetooth. I'll have to figure it out. It's been acting a little... Are you using wireless CarPlay? Yeah, love it. Love it. Good. But uh, but the... Uh, and yesterday, it wouldn't recognize the CarPlay. So maybe I rebooted the phone. I may be a phone thing. You never know. Could it be an Apple thing? But uh, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm able to I use it. It's just, you know... I got, I got to drive the... Um, uh, new 2022 Chevy Bolt EUV. Oh yeah, uh, Lisa wanted step. to know about that. I yeah, July. Yeah, well, the, the driving impressions are embargoed till tomorrow. Oh okay, um, but so you can't uh, say it a had word. We love our yeah. Bolt, you know. I'll, I'll I'll send you guys a link to uh, the review when it goes Good. up tomorrow. I look forward to it. Yeah, thank but, you. Uh, Super, Super Cruise is great. Yeah, yeah, I can't wait to try it. Yeah. All right, have a good one. All right. Bye. Take care. See you Sam. next week. Bye-bye. I'm still so puzzled. <sighs> what uh, what Lou's going to have to do? Are you still there, Lou? Good. Yep, I'm here. Yeah, I put a link in the show notes. Uh, Scooter X gave us this link to stevepenny.com, Google Viagra spam hack. And uh, he recommends using Google's webmaster tools to see what's going on. Um, five steps you must take when your Google listings turn into Viagra spam. Um, oh, man. Yeah, it's, in, in every case, it looks like your site is modified. It's not, it's not happening to Google. And that's, that, when I went to Bing and got the same result, that confirmed that it's your site. So... Unless their crawlers would respond to the same hack somewhere else, huh? Yeah, I, I'm going to put this in the show notes and you can read it and see if this makes any sense for you. Leo Laporte, the tech guy, still talking to Arizona Lou. I guess this is not an uncommon thing. We found a, a page we'll put in the show notes, the... The title of the page is Google Viagra Pharma Hack Hitting Websites Hard. What to do when your Google listings turn into spam. And it's complicated. It's complicated. He has some ways to diagnose it. And then five steps you have to take to uh, eliminate it. And essentially it comes down to, Lou, uh, quarantine, quarantining your site <laughs> and securing the host. In other words, there's, some, there's probably some software on there that's doing the redirect 
It has to be because it's not just Google. It's happening uh, on Bing, too. Um, you definitely want to fix this. You definitely want to fix this. But we'll put this, uh, this whole thing... Um, <laughs> this actually refers back the Steve Penny post refers back to a support post at Google from a government site <laughs> uh, from Los Altos Hills, California uh, apparently was hacked with this exact same thing he calls it the Google conditional hack um, and I guess it's it's a complicated thing to fix anyway we'll uh, certainly not something I can uh, I can help you with over the phone, but I will Lou put uh, these two links in the show notes. You can try to try to do it yourself. I don't think you need, you know, the the GoDaddy thing is mostly uh, a convenience. It's I think the thing that works with the GoDaddy security tool is the malware scan, where it looks through your site for malware. You probably can do that yourself as well. Uh, maybe even better because you're going to do it by hand and you know what the site looks like. But you will want to read these articles to figure out what it is and what to look for. What a mess. What a mess. Um, somebody in the chat room uh, who's quite the expert, actually. Um, Hawaii Cop says, you're going to have to do it through GoDaddy. I know I did. The reason is when people search for Arizona Lou, it forwards the same pharmacy website. And GoDaddy knows all about it. Thank you, GoDaddy. Wow. Wow. Yeah, and I, you know, ultimately, I think your best bet is to go to a. For instance, I have sites on Squarespace, WordPress, and my own site. And both Squarespace and WordPress, they don't charge you for a secure SSL site. There's a checkbox, which is really a better way to do that. You really want to have that turned on. I don't. It's not really probably related to this, but it. But it's something else you should definitely do. Dylan from Temecula, California is next. Hi, Dylan. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hey, Dylan. Hello. Hey. Hi. What can I? Oh, Dylan, we've talked before, haven't we? I don't think. Oh no. Okay. You must be another. Must be another young fella. How old are you, Dylan? Um, I'm twelve, almost thirteen. All right. All right. And you're into computers? Yeah. What do you like to do? Is it more than Fortnite? Um, I don't play Fortnite. I usually play Call of Duty and other things. Good man. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, no, no more Minecraft for you, huh? You grew out of it? Yeah. Yeah. So what can I do for you, Dylan? Um. So I'm at my dad's house and... um. I couldn't bring my keyboard over. Oh, okay. So, um, I have a keyboard at my mom's house that I plug into my gaming laptop. Oh, because the keyboard's broken on the laptop? Yeah, I guess. But it I, it's brand new, and I got it like a month ago. Oh, well, they should really fix and, that. So did not, did the key, none of the keys work on the laptop? No. No, the keyboard on the laptop won't work. Was it new when you got it? Yeah. Yeah, so Asus... You need to you need to call them, and that's a defect out of the factory. They have to fix that f for free. Uh, but meanwhile, you're stuck here, and you can't play Call of Duty because you don't have access to uh, the keys. Nope. Nope. Does Dad have a keyboard? Uh, no. No, come on, no keyboards in the house. No. No. Oh man, <laughs> I think you're out of luck. <laughs> yeah, but the thing was, when I got it, the keys on it worked. But when I got my external keyboard at my mom's house, and I plugged it in, that worked. And then when I took it to my dad's this week, oh, the keys on the actual keyboard didn't work. So the keys and were working it. until you used an external USB. You were using a USB keyboard. Yeah. Yeah, and then after you unplugged it, the keys stopped working. That sounds like the computer went. Yeah. Oh, he doesn't need me anymore. He just oh, okay. he's he's got his own keyboard. He brings his own keyboard. So that sounds like the laptop keyboard was disabled. Now I'm not sure how they do this on an Asus, but we can give you some ideas. Let me just Google uh, Asus disable laptop keyboard. Because they're probably yeah. Yeah. 
So it may be that this got this happened. There's a couple of ways to disable the laptop keyboard. And it may be that it happened uh, when you plugged it in automatically. So the first thing to do, how techie techy are you, Dylan? You're pretty you're pretty geeky. Yeah. Yeah? You know what the device manager is? Yep. You know what that is? Oh man, you're good. Okay, so Windows key R. Windows key R will uh, open a, a command line, and you can type in, this is ridiculous, but I'm going to tell you anyway, D-E-V-M-G-M-T dot M-S-C. You know what? That's silly. I'm looking at a Google search. That's a silly thing. Just <laughs> all you have to do is Windows key X, and you'll see in that menu device manager. And once you go to the device manager's list of all the hardware, look for the keyboard section. Yeah. See, it says keyboards. Yep. Standard, yeah. in my case, standard PS2 keyboard. I bet yours is similar. Make sure that mm -hmm. that is enabled. It hasn't. It hasn't been disabled. Okay, that's the first thing. The first thing to do. It says it's enabled, and it says um, update driver. But I already went through all of that, and I updated. Oh, you already did all this. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, I wonder if there's a special key. There is on mine. Um, there is a key to, I think, disable the keyboard on mine. Let me see if that does that. I'm not sure. But I think that that might be there's a key that you hit. Have you gone through all the Google searches, how to fix the keyboard, things like that? Yeah. I'm yeah. Not Anybody in the chat room have an idea? Um, is it NumLock? Yeah, make sure, I would look at the function keys and make sure that you didn't hit one that disabled the built-in keyboard. Yeah, I, I looked through all of that, but I hit every single one of them, and none of the keys on my keyboard work. Oh, yeah, that's right. You can't do it because you can't use the keys. Yeah. That's, I'm a dummy. <laughs> uh Okay. <laughs> uh, I take it you probably tried to turn the computer off and on again, right? Yep. Yeah. Um, think he's in tablet mode? You could try tablet mode. That'll give you access to the keys. So that's one way to, to get to the keys, not to play the game, but just to see if we can fix this problem. There, That, that yeah. might... That, have you tried that, gone to tablet mode? Yeah, on-screen keyboard. On-screen keyboard. Know. Yeah, I don't have a tablet. No, you don't need one. If you just go to the control center, you know, move your mouse, you know, move your mouse to the lower right, click control center, and you and you put yourself in tablet mode. You sh in most lap most Windows laptops, you can do that. Oh, but you don't have a touch screen, do you? Is that what no, you're saying? You don't have a touch screen. Yeah. Uh, all right. Another thing you might try is to reboot and go into your setup and make sure that the keyboard isn't disabled in setup you know that bio setup when you first get into the key the the computer you hit escape oh, or yeah. delete you know i can't it's different on every computer so i'm not sure what it is on the asus but you hit escape or delete or f1 or something and then it does that try that too i got i have to run dylan but if you want to hang on i can help you through through the top of the hour i showed it that's a that's a bad one i don't know what's going on okay sorry dylan i turned off my mic your mouse works right Oh, yeah, my mouse works, but my, none of my keys on my keys. Yeah, yeah. So um, you can, <laughs> if the mouse works, you can go to the start menu and uh, and then go to um, ease, Windows Ease of Use, which I think is a control panel setting. And there you can turn on the keyboard there, the on-screen keyboard there, which would give you access. You, you know, you'd be typing with your mouse, not your fingers. Yeah. It's an ASUS and ASUS, right? I didn't misunderstand. It's it's not an ASUS, it's an ASUS, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So once you get into settings, look at ease of use. And one thing you might want to, you know, there's a keyboard setting. One thing you might want to make sure is um, it's not disabled, but you also might want to uh, update the keyboard driver, right? It said update driver. That might might be the driver got screwed up. You know, it's possible... You know, come to think of it, maybe that's what happened. When you plugged in the external keyboard, it might have loaded a driver for itself. 
And that's maybe why the uh, keyboard's not working? Um, yeah. But, so, I already tried updating the drivers, and it wouldn't let me because it said the drivers are already updated to the latest version. Yeah, maybe try removing them and then let it reinstall without the keyboard plugged in. See if that does it. You know what I mean? So you can remove the drivers. Yeah. You won't have a keyboard, but you, <laughs> you're no worse off than you were before. And then reboot. Look at this. Raymond Toth has found a Asus support. How to fix keyboard problems. Hmm. Hmm. This doesn't look like it. It's saying go to the uh, reinstall the driver, which we said. So you might want to try that. It also says uh, yeah. update the BIOS. And that might be something you want to try. Um, keyboard troubleshooter. Oh, there is a keyboard troubleshooter. So it, I already troubleshooted it. You already did that? It popped up. Yeah. This is frustrating. You're sitting there. You want to play Call of Duty. You don't want to have to talk to your father or anything. And, man, and nothing's working. Uh, yeah. Um, if, if this... So that's interesting. So it worked until you plugged in the external keyboard. Then all of a sudden... When you unplug the external keyboard, it stopped working. That's yeah. really interesting. That's really interesting. I mean, it may be that you have to restore Windows uh, to get to this point. I'm going to, if you can go to the uh, techguylabs.com site, we got, we're got we putting links up as we speak, and I, we're going to put uh, all the links that we've seen, including the ASUS support link. Um, right. Does it keep, so... Oh, yeah, this is a good test. Thank you. Uh, Kay Cordius says, and, uh, you know, I should have mentioned this. If when you're going into setup, BIOS, if you can get into setup by hitting the F1 or escape or delete key, that means your keyboard is working, right? It's just that once um, Windows starts, it's not. Right? So if that... I don't know how to get to it. Yeah, let me just check and see what that is on Asus. Asus... Bio settings. Is that your dad? I hear him in the background. He's helping. The F2 yeah. key. So when you so shut down the computer. Okay. Turn it back on and press and while it's coming on, press and hold the F2 key. Okay. And and then if if your keyboard's working, it will actually show you the BIOS setup. Don't release the F2 key until you see the BIOS display screen. That's how you do that on an Asus. I just looked it up. <clears throat> okay. But uh, if that works, that means your keyboard's fine. There's something in Windows that's that's blocking it. And then my theory is the only way I could explain this is when you plugged in the uh, external keyboard, it installed some weirdo driver that is blocking the uh, laptop keyboard. So uninstall the keyboard driver completely, yeah. reboot the computer, and Windows at that point will say, well, let, we, I don't see a keyboard driver. Let me go get one, and it'll get the right one for the laptop. You might even be able to get it directly from Asus if you go to the Asus website. They usually have drivers for every model. Okay. You're going to get this working, Dylan. I think you are. I think uh, you are. So I'm, I'm at the BIOS. So and it worked. Works. So that's good yeah. news. So your keyboard's not broken. Windows is broken. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> so I would suggest, first of all, look through BIOS. Make sure there's nothing that disables the keyboard. I don't think there is. I've never seen that in a BIOS, but you should look. And no. then since you're in there. And then, uh, oh, good. Now just reboot, you know, reset, quit and reboot. And um, <clears throat> I think what you want to do is use the mouse uh, and get go to the device manager and just delete the keyboard driver just delete it okay and then reboot uh, and see if windows says oh we need to reinstall this and maybe it will you may i mean uh, you don't want to reinstall windows that's a pain in the butt um yeah yeah but there is if you go to um if you uh there is a way to repair windows so if you go to recovery in the and the, you know, hit Windows key and uh, and recovery. It's in the settings. Actually, you can't type, can you? But if you go to recovery in the settings, uh, you can repair the computer. And I think that that's kind of what you want. If if this other okay. thing doesn't work, try the repair. Okay. It's the repair okay. control panel. Okay. 
Okay. Hey, it's great to talk to you, Dylan. This is part of being a, a geek is you have to deal with this stuff. Thanks, Leo. Yeah, you're welcome, Dad. <laughs> I hope you I hope you play Call of Duty today. Whack some Nazis Bye. for me. Get some zombies. All right, I All right. will. Take care, Dylan. Bye. All right, me too. Well, this was this was two intractable problems today. I just I tell you, yeah. Generally, I think deleting the keyboard and rebooting will do it. That's just my theory. Unless, I mean, I didn't want to say this. It is possible that something happened. There was a short from that USB keyboard, something like that. I, but no, no, no. We know it's not because F two worked. So his keyboard's fine. It's just a uh, just a matter of. Some, something's happened in Windows and my best guess is that that USB keyboard installed its own driver on top of right does that make sense well hey 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 how are you today Leo Laporte here the tech guy time to talk computers the internet home theater digital photography smartphones smart watches broken keyboards websites that refer to spam all of that that's what we're talking about on the show today. Uh, tough problems so far. Hour number one. That was a doozy. 8888-ASK-LEO. That's my number. Sometimes people call in and say, oh, this is such a simple question. Please give me some simple ones, okay? 888-827-5536. Toll free from anywhere in the U.S. or Canada outside that area. Call Skype. Uh, use Skype and you should be able to reach us. We will put links for both Arizona Lou and Dylan up on the website, techguylabs.com come up with a lot of ideas Dylan uh, oh that, I could feel his pain you know he was at his mom's and uh, he has a brand new laptop brand new Asus laptop and he, he thought well I'm going to play Call of Duty I want to have a nice keyboard plugged in the keyboard now somebody Nerdette in the chat room did say something interesting some of those keyboards if it's a wireless keyboard they have a little dongle you plug into the USB port make sure you unplug that dongle maybe that's confusing your built-in keyboard. But for whatever reason, he plugged in a new keyboard. Worked fine. Goes to his dad's house. Leaves the external keyboard at home. He doesn't need it. He's got his laptop keyboard, except it won't work. And now he can't play Call of Duty. I feel your pain. So my best guess is the external keyboard had its own driver, which it installed, which is confused Windows and I think the best thing to do, delete the keyboard driver. When you have a hardware issue sometimes, going into the device manager, deleting the device driver, just delete it, restart. Windows is usually smart enough to go, hey, I don't see the keyboard driver. Let me find one. And, uh, well, in this case, because you don't have that other keyboard plugged in, download the right driver. Let's cross our fingers. Let's cross our fingers. <laughs> Thank you, chat room, for all your suggestions. Uh, that's the. By the way, that's the good news here. Is you're not just asking me. I have a, a contingent of experts in our chat room. You could be one of them. Team Tech Guy, irc.twit.tv. They this they thrive on this. They sit there. They're waiting all day. They're going. I can. I can help. I can help. And they're jumping in. And that's great. And they give me links. And it's wonderful. So, uh, you're not just asking me. We've got a, a whole team of hundreds of people ready to help you. Not to mention the million listening on the radio who are going, I don't know what's going on. I can't help them. Fletcher in the Cleve Groveland, Florida. Hello, Fletcher. Hello, Leo. How are you doing, kind <laughs> sir? Uh, I am good, and I just saw your question, and I thought, well, it's going to be a hard day today. What can I do for it's you? It's going to be three for three, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> three for three. What can I do for you? <laughs> All right. Well, I consider myself a retro programmer. Uh, okay. I've been doing programming since, gosh, the late 80s when I was in the military. Okay. And back in the military in Japan, we uh, used Xenix. Xenix. As you may recall, that's Microsoft's version of Unix. Yeah. Great little thing. I loved it to death. So fast forward about 20, 30, 40, good Lord, 40 years. And um, and so now we're talking, I was like, okay, I need to do some retro programming. I do programming on the 64, the 128, all that kind of fun stuff using the tools that I used back then. The so fun, a, it is more fun, isn't it? It's a little, it's, yeah. It's yeah. tough as nails, but it's a lot of fun. Yeah, because it's a, it's a uh, challenge for the brain and, it's always easier to do something in a constrained environment than a wide open environment. If anything goes, then it's hard to know what to do. But if you got to do it within these narrow 
constraints and makes it a little more, I think it's a little more fun. It's like writing a sonnet instead I, of a free-form verse. I, um, I mean, I, 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 uh, I write in C and other weird languages all day long, all the time. C's great. C's great. Writing. Yeah. I love it. It's oh, great. yeah. It's a simple, so, beautiful, uh, elegant language that can get you into so much trouble. <laughs> Easily. Which is what we want. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. It's more fun to debug it. Yeah. C was the original language written for Unix. Xenix is a Unix. By the way, uh, Microsoft sold it to, to SCO, the Santa Cruz operation, and it became SCO Unix. So it's still around, believe it or not, um, but not as Xenix. I, where did you get a copy of it? Well, that's that's the easy part. Um, if you just do a quick, some quick Google searching online, uh, Windows PC, I believe it's where I got my copy of Xenix 386. Nice. And you install and, it on any PC, or do you need anything special? You can install it on a PC, um, but I've been trying to install it on a virtual box. Okay. You know, just to have it yeah. plug into and have some fun. Yeah. Uh, and I get to the get to the install um, software, and it runs just fine. Uh, I'll have fun, but then they asked me some questions that I have long since forgotten how to answer, and I'm hoping you might have the answer. <laughs> All right, I got an old brain, but we'll so, see. Okay, so uh, we should explain what he's doing. He's running a normal Windows PC, but on it he has some software, free software, which is actually quite good from Oracle, called VirtualBox, which lets you run other operating systems inside a box, basically on that Windows machine. Uh, normally, people, you know, do things like Linux or but I don't see any reason why an old, old, you know, 386 program shouldn't or operating system shouldn't run in there. What, what are they asking? Well, they're asking. Uh, this is this is the fun part. Is for the hard drive. It's not just a matter of hey, I have a MFM hard drive. Right. No, that, that's way too easy. It asks instead for the number of cylinders, the number of heads, <laughs> uh, the number of sections per track, size of pipe, blah 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 blah. And it doesn't give you defaults. Yeah. It doesn't say. 1024 no. cylinders or anything like that? No. No. And it's got to be mathematically correct or else it won't work. Yeah, that's right. So, so, uh, so that's where I'm kind So of those older machines, I, I know, I do remember 1024 cylinders. That I do remember as well. Yeah, yes. yeah. Those are, the, those are the older machines. And then, um, let's see. Um, I'm going to say it's a, let's assume it's a two gigabyte SCSI drive. How about that? Uh, you're asking a lot there. I am asking a lot. Gigabytes. <laughs> yeah, usually we're talking megabytes. Yeah, you, you, that would be the maximum it could handle with 1024 cylinders, probably. Okay. Um, yeah. Try, uh, boy, I don't know, 255 heads and 63 sectors. You'll notice, by the way, those numbers are interesting. They are, represent 8 bits from 0 to 255, right? And they and then they represent uh, four bits from zero to sixty four. So, the, it's going to be on that uh, or zero to sixty three. It's going to be on that border there, like that. So I would try if if two fifty five sixty three doesn't work, you can probably figure out what to do next. Maybe five eleven and one twenty seven. That kind of thing. Okay. Yeah. All right. I'll give that a shot. I was just hoping that. I to me, the best website in the world for me would be one I put in, hey, I have a 20 megabyte hard drive. What would be... Yeah, nice MFM. I remember those 20 megabytes as nice. Well, mm -hmm. can have you Googled MFM uh, hard drive specs? <laughs> I mean, you know what? I don't think I have. <laughs> <laughs> Come to think of it, that's probably the easiest way to find it. Uh, yeah, Wikipedia talks about the, the world famous, and I had them, Seagate uh, ST506s. Let's see if it's beautiful, beautiful device. Let's see if it has the geometry in here. I think it does, yeah. So, uh, you know, it's funny. Yeah. So, it's funny because, uh, ironically, I've been t talking about this lately with my friend Steve Gibson. He writes that software that uh, so many people use to recover hard drives called Spinrite. And it was written in that era. And he supports those old drives. And he talked a lot on a couple episodes ago. You might want to listen to Security Now, the podcast, because he talks about handling arbitrary drive architectures and tr you, a lot of times you have to trick the operating system if you want to go you know anything past 20 megabytes <laughs> so, so i think i think 1024 uh i would try 51163 and see what happens all it will do is not work yeah exactly i'll just be right where i am but, yeah. Uh, yeah yeah and uh, don't forget when you set up the modem you want seven bits even parity one stop bit right yes okay good <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> just checking. I appreciate that. <laughs> it's a play. Well, you see, the questions, they get so much easier as time goes by. Holy cow, Fletcher. Have fun. So you're writing in C on Xenix in a virtual machine. I am. Plus, I have to be at the full confession. Uh, there was a game on there. You can get a... Um, That's the real reason. Uh, it's called... Uh, called NetHack. That's NetHack is called. awesome. Hack. Yeah, NetHack is so much fun. Okay. When I was a tender age of 19 years old, I used to log in via a 1200-bond modem into the central system. We're going to we're gonna get Dylan playing NetHack. That's awesome. That's what we need to do. <laughs> it, it was uh, plain ASCII, right? But you're you're a little, uh, you know, dungeon crawler yeah. walking around. You're a little, yeah, a little at sign running around. And little at sign. Try to attack you. Holy cow. <laughs> well, good luck getting that going. Nice to talk Thanks. to you, Fletcher. Thank you. I appreciate yeah. it. Blast from the past. This is the only reason <laughs> this is worth thinking about for the, the vast majority of us. Uh, you know, it's history. It's, it's well, thank goodness, long gone. You don't have to, you used to have to think about things like this when you were using a computer, but not anymore. That's all, you know, you can be oblivious to all this. But I think uh, besides it being kind of a fun bit of, you know, nostalgic trivia for us oldsters. It's kind of, I think it doesn't hurt to know a little bit of the underlying thing. Uh, the, the, in the early days of hard drives, it was just, you know, everybody had a hard drive uh, with 1,024 cylinders because it could be represented. Um, how many, how many uh, bits is that? It's a certain number of bits, right? And it never, I can't even remember. It, can't, it could never go any higher. I think it's, what, is that 16 bits? 8 bits is, uh, anyway. Anyway. No, it's, uh, yeah. I'll have to, I have to do some math. It's been a long time. But this was, this was, uh, this was the, the world we lived in back in the day. I know you don't care. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Remember the robots playing this song? Maybe that's just in my head. Is it Herbie Hancock? Who is it? Yeah. Yeah, I, I, it was a TV show and they had, never mind. 80, maybe it was just a bad dream. 8888, ask Leo the phone number. Back to the phones we go. I'm crossing my fingers, want a nice, easy call. Tony in uh, Washington, D.C. Hi, Tony. Hey, Leo. How are you doing again? Uh, don't laugh. Don't <laughs> laugh. Okay, go ahead. No, no, I'm, I'm really flattered because I was listening to you and Dylan and I was like. Oh, isn't that amazing? That's amazing. I love it. Can, can call up, and he knew so much. He'd already done everything I suggested. Yeah, he knew so much, and I was like, "Wow, that is so cool." Yeah, it's uh, it's funny because those of us who grew up with computing uh, know that you know we, we went through this whole all these phases, and we did all this stuff. And you look at the kids; they didn't. They grew up. They grew up with an iPad. They grew up. They didn't. You know, they, this this is part of their life. And some of them. So I would say the majority of them are very comfortable using it, but have no interest in it. It's like it's just a thing. It's an appliance. And then there's kids like Dylan, maybe because he's motivated because he wants to play Call of Duty, but for whatever reason, <laughs> who just want to get down into the into the nuts and bolts of it. And I, uh, I think that's great. We need more people like that. Otherwise, who's going to make these things? So what can I do for you, Tony? So I went out to the Apple store. I, I need you first to get me some more money. So okay. <laughs> I, went to, I went to the Apple store. Okay. I bought the Apple, um, um, I, the iPod, the HomePod. The HomePods. HomePods. Those, did you get the big one or the little one? I got the big one. I got the, the big one. one. Okay. Yeah, they're nice and huge. They're nice. And they sound good, don't they? They do sound yeah. good. You know, and I just bought it last night, so I'm learning how to work it. So for my iMac, I learned just now while I was on hold with you how to transfer Siri from the iMac to the iPod which is cool. Um, but now I have a bonus question for you. Okay. I want to go back out and buy, I want to buy a couple more. I want to pull all around my house. Yes. I'm wondering that if I'm in the living room and I tell, if I tell Siri to play some music, will all of them play all over the house or? You can do both. I can. Yeah. Cool. So the home pods will do, and this is a, applies to the new minis too. In fact, I, I bought five minis for that very reason. I wasn't going to spend. They're three hundred bucks for the big boys you bought. That's a lot of money. I wasn't going to do that. So I bought five of the hundred buck ones. Still expensive, but now I've got them all over the room. And there's some fun things you can do. You can, you can uh, do. Um, they used to call it party mode. Uh, what is whole home 
play, right? But you can also, each one has a name, so you can also say play on any particular HomePod by name with Siri. Okay. okay. So um, the way you do it, do you have an, uh, you said you have a, uh, do you have an iPod or an iPhone? I have an iPhone and okay. I have an iMac. Remember, the last time I talked to you, I'm waiting to get the, the, um, the, the, the MacBook Pro 16 M1 when it comes out. Oh, yeah, you're going to love it. Those are really nice. So let's see. You go into the Home app on your device. Uh -huh. Okay. And then you can name each HomePod. You can even assign it to a room. In fact, that's what I would do because it's easier to remember a room like bedroom, living room, kitchen, that yes. kind of thing. Um, and then I, th let's see, how do we do, how do we tell you know who to play on all of them? That's that's what you want, and I know we can do it. They also have a nice new intercom feature where you can talk from one to the other, which is really really yeah. You try try that one too, but let's get let's get this first. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm looking at iMore. My friend uh, Renee Ritchie used to work there. I had many friends that worked there. How to add multi-room audio to your AirPlay 2 supported speakers, which includes the the HomePod as well. Um, I think basically you use the word everywhere. So you can say, hey, Shlomo, I'm using that instead of, you know. Who. Right, right. Hey, Shlomo, play, uh, what's your favorite music? Beatles. Play the Beatles on bedroom. And then it'll play it on the bedroom one. Or, hey, hey, Shlomo, play Beatles everywhere. And then it should play them everywhere. You have to... You have to set it up uh, in the home app that you have each one named and so forth, but it should play them everywhere. Okay, and then, cool. and, and then, so you can do each room by name, but you can all everywhere is the is the key word that you want. It'll do the whole house. And the nice thing is they do it in nice sync. You don't get echo or anything. It sounds like the the house is a big one, big speaker. That's what I was hoping for. Yeah, that's what I was yeah. looking for. Yeah, it's really nice. Yeah, and then um, yeah, try. I can't remember the intercom uh, syntax, but they just with the uh, latest update, they just added the uh, HomePod intercom. I haven't used it yet because I don't want to scare my family, but I, <laughs> I, I believe you can say things like, uh, "Tell bedroom, here I come," or you can say, "Hey Shlomo, ask everyone." What time is it in the whole house? <laughs> hey, Shlomo, ask everyone, where are my shoes? And the whole house will light up. It's great fun for all. They just added that. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hey, Shlomo, ask... The, I've, been, I've been wanting to do this one. Ask the kitchen to bring me my coffee. But I know my wife would kill me. <laughs> pseudo make me a sandwich <laughs> so you can say by room you can say uh, everyone you could for intercom but you have to say uh you there are a few keywords there's intercom um you can say ask everyone you can say announce so you can say hey shlomo announce upstairs Come down. We're about to leave. So, and then you can reply. <laughs> I haven't tried this. I'm nervous. You can say, hey, Shlomo, reply. They're up here where you left them. Or, hey, Shlomo, reply over my dead body. That kind of thing. <laughs> hey, Shlomo, reply. No, you bring me coffee. Hey, you know what? You know what, my friends? This show today, this Tech Guy podcast, brought to you by Uber for Business. This is actually a great tool for a business that wants to uh, spiff its employees or encourage its customers. With Uber for Business, you can buy vouchers good for Uber rides or Uber food delivery. So there's lots of ways you can use this. Imagine you've got an event coming up. You say, let me buy you lunch. How are you going to buy me lunch? It's on Zoom. No problem. Here's a voucher. You go get lunch, get it ordered, get it delivered, and we'll have this nice meeting together. Or, or employees, you know, you're working late. Let me buy you dinner tonight. Or a ride home. Or both. Uber for business. If you'd like 
trying to find a way to stand out to your customers or make your employees feel extra valued. Uber for business is such a great idea. I mean, you, you already use probably Uber to, to do rides and meals from restaurants you love. Well, Uber's business platforms designed specifically for businesses, 160,000 companies use Uber for business, great for customer and employee satisfaction. Get people to show up to events, get people... I, you know, I was thinking, I wish my uh, car dealer were using it because then he could have said, look, let me send you an Uber so that you can come over and get your new car on us. Perfect, right? It's easy to add $20 uh, to their personal Uber account so they can order meals through Uber Eats before the meeting. And uh, you could actually, it's really nice because you can say how much of the meal you'll pay for or how much of the ride you'll pay for all or just part of it. It's very easy to send, very easy to redeem, very easy to create. Any company can sign up. It's absolutely free. You can immediately start sending out vouchers and you don't pay a thing until they cash them in. So if they never use it, no harm, no foul. They're very easy. You have total control over who gets them. You can say when they expire and you can send them via text or email redeemed very easily for your customers. You don't want to make your customers jump through hoops. They just tap the, the tap the link, redeem it. They've got the credit now in their Uber account. I love this. Right now, for a limited time, you get a $50 voucher when you create your first vouchers campaign and spend $200 or more. You just go to Uber, U-B, you know how to spell that, U-B-E-R, uber.com slash tech guy to learn more. Uber.com slash tech guy. $50 voucher waiting for you when you set up a campaign and spend more than 200 bucks. Some terms and conditions apply. Uber.com slash tech guy. I think of lots of good ways to use this. Working overtime, send him a cup of coffee. You know, a little, little something. Even the little thing makes a big difference. Uber.com slash tech guy. And we thank them for supporting the show. And thank you for supporting the show by using that URL and setting up an account. Get your 50 buck voucher. Uh, now back to the calls. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Normally at this time, Chris Marquardt, our photo guy, would join us. But uh, he, he sent us a message by smoke signal. His internet is out. Oh, isn't that a horrible feeling? So uh, he cannot join us over the internet. But I will, on his behalf, uh, remind you that we are doing uh, his usual assignment. I think there's one more week to take a photo illustrating the word, the concept, the idea, weird. Oh, we're going to get some weird ones. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's, just, that's just begging for trouble. So what is weird to you? Uh, here's, what, here's how this all works. You uh, take the picture, uh, and the whole idea of this is to get out there and take more pictures, right? So it doesn't have to be with a fancy phone or anything like that. It, it could be... Uh, it could be with your, your your smartphone, as long as it's weird. Now, take the picture. If you got one you like, once a week, you can uh, tag it with, upload it to Flickr, which is a photo sharing site, and then tag it with the words TG Weird for Tech Guy Weird. So that way we know it's your your uh, submission for the assignment. All the rules are uh, at the Tech Guy group, by the way, on Flickr. So I guess really the best thing to do, join Flickr.com, free. Join the Tech Guy group, also free. You know you're in the right place. You see a picture by me. You'll also see uh, 13,740 members, 7,000 photos. It's a pretty active group. Since 2007. <laughs> Golly. We've been doing that a long time. Uh, probably one of the older groups on Flickr. So once you're there, you'll see the rules. Renee Silverman, our administrator, who she's been doing it for years, too. Thank you, Renee. Uh, she's put the rules up. Weird. All cameras are welcome. Any pictures uh, taken before the end of January and not tagged with TG Weird will not be allowed in the pool because we want you to take brand new pictures and, and weird pictures and then add them to the pool with the tag TG Weird. And I think it's going to be next week. That'd be my guess. I think next week um, we'll see Chris Marquardt's review. He'll pick a three of them that illustrate the concept in some interesting way. He'll talk about it next week. Meanwhile, that gives me more time to talk to you. So let's go to Glenn in Malibu, California. Hi, Glenn. Hey, Leo. How are you? I'm well. How are you? Couldn't be any better. It's just beautiful here. Oh, that's nice. Do you see the ocean from where you are? 
I can if I stand on my toes. <laughs> and look over the hedge. <laughs> oh, I know. I'm you know, the, the, the movie stars the bought up all the oceanfront property. I know. It's okay. What can I do for you? But they're not happy about it. No, um, of course I, not. <laughs> I, have a, I have a four terabyte iMac. Okay. And I purchased, I purchased um, iDrive with the hope that I could do a, a cloud-based cloning of the drive. Right. And... I paid, I paid for the $149 piece. They couldn't have been nicer. I started to back stuff up. And then when I called them and said, I don't see any place to do the cloud storage, they said, well, we, don't, we can't do that for a Mac. We can oh. only do it for a Windows machine. Oh, that sucks. So imaging is not the first thing. They do support it, but it's not the first thing I would do uh, with a cloud, any cloud backup because that's going to be huge. And, and remember, you have to upload it. So, yeah, they give you five terabytes of storage. You got the room, but, but it's, it's not uploading even at your full upload speed, which is already a fraction of your download speed. Right. So, in fact, I know you've recommended in the past to do on-site storage. So I had done that, but we lost our house in oh. the mountain fire. Oh, I'm so sorry. So all that, well, that's a good way to clean out the garage. Holy cow, I'm so sorry. So you lost those local backups. Exactly, exactly. So that's why I thought a cloud-based would, even though it was slow, would be better than what I don't have. Here, I think the easiest way to do this is make a backup and, and physically take it off-site. Got it. Okay. Especially with images. The reason is images are, are immediately out of date. As soon as you change one thing, that image is out of date. So the iDrive is really designed around incremental backup. So what I would do is do the image, take it to work, give it... <laughs> Steve Gibson used to mail CDs to his mom. She'd say, one of these. He says, don't worry about it, Ma. Just put it somewhere safe and I'll let you know if I need it. Wh whatever it is, get it out of the house. Now you know why. Oh, I'm so sorry. That sucks. And then, no, no, uh, and then you're going to do the incremental backup to iDrive. So you've got the image done, and you do the incremental backup. And that way, if you you know you have another disaster, you can restore the image. But remember, the image was only up to date at the moment you made it. And then the incremental changes you did download from iDrive. I think that's a much more efficient way to do it. Okay. Okay. They so will send you, and they probably told you this. They'll they'll send you a hard drive. Oh, they did, but it doesn't work with Mac. Is that what you're saying? Exactly. Oh. I never realized that. So they've formatted them NTFS probably, and they don't support the Mac file yeah, system. Yeah, and uh, maybe I maybe I just talked to the wrong guy. But but what I, I was told you know I don't know. I'll ask. I will definitely ask. Um, seems like whatever form there there are a couple of solutions. One is you could use the disk they sent you and put some software on your Mac that would let you write to it, which would probably be the easiest. It's called Fuse. It's free. Okay. Fuse for the Mac. Um, it's it it lets you see other file formats. Um, uh, but honestly, I still think it, uh, it's it's a bit. No, I can just buy another G. I I have I had G drives. I can just buy another. Yeah, buy a G drive. Or you even don't even have to get a fancy one. Those are expensive. Um, okay. What do you recommend? Uh, Western Digital makes them. You can get an inexpensive, less expensive Western Digital external. Okay, perfect. Put it on those. and Because the thing is, you're not using it. Speed isn't important. You're just going to make the backup and take it to work. Yeah, yeah. Oh, Glenn, I'm sorry. How long ago was the fire? Uh, 19, uh, it's uh, 2018. Uh, Golly. 19, have, you, have you pretty much recovered from it? or? We have. Um there's a thing in Malibu called permits, which are a little... Oh, gosh, I can only imagine. Yeah, so... Are you rebuilding in the same spot? Yeah, absolutely. Good. All absolutely. right. Yeah. Well, good luck. I'm so sorry that happened. And, you know, I say it in the ads. <laughs> the people who back up are the ones who've lost data. I mean, that really brings it home. I hope you didn't yeah. lose too much uh, of value. You know what? You know what? It could have been a whole lot worse. Yeah. I've talked... We have, of course, a lot of fire survivors up here, uh, too, in Northern California. And yeah, yeah. A lot yeah. of them sure. take that, I think, very philosophical point of view of, hey, we survived. Um, the rest is just things. But As my dad said so astutely, if you have clean sheets, lots of hot water, and a refrigerator, you're doing better than 90% of the world. That's really true. We're doing pretty good. It, we're do, yeah. We're doing pretty good. That's the right way to think about it, Glenn. I'm sorry that happened to you, but nice to talk no, to don't you. Don't be. Yeah. Don't be. Nice to talk to you, and thank you for all you do. I did go to the iDrive people because of your show that I thank listened you. to. Really yeah, and I'm sorry they let you down. Um, no, I'll, no, I'm going to – I'll, I'll talk yeah. to them. Yeah. And maybe, maybe I misunderstood as well, but it wasn't a letdown. 
I think what you just gave me is the appropriate work. You wouldn't have it backed up. <laughs> you would probably not have it backed up till 2022. I mean, it really takes that long because they don't want to use up all your bandwidth. So they trickle it up. It would take a long time to back up a few terabytes. I wouldn't do it. Yeah. Uh, Costco, Costco Scooter X says Costco has a Seagate 8 terabyte hard drive for $149.99. Tell him he's going to have to beat me there. I'm getting in the car right now. <laughs> Great to talk to you, Glenn. Stay All safe. Right, thank you so Take much. care. Bye-bye. Oh, that that's a terrifying thought. Terrifying thought. Lose everything. And, of course, you you know, they are just things. But some of them, yeah, they have some real sentimental value. You'd hate to lose them. You really would. Frank on the line from uh, San Francisco. Hi, Frank. Oh, run to the phone. Run to the phone, Frank. I'm here. I'm here. Sorry, we kept Sorry. you on hold so long. Sorry about that, Lee. No, no, my fault. I, was up. I wasn't thinking I, that, 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 that I, was, uh, I was actually up for a while, so I apologize. No, no, my fault. What can I do for you, Frank? I got a question for you. I need, uh, I actually need, uh, I actually need uh, and, and then to buy a new smartphone. Okay. And my question is, I, well, and, and I'm looking for a phone. I don't want my phone vendor uh, then to be censoring my content. Oh, I hate and that. So is there yeah? Is there a phone that I can buy that? So if I, if I want to, if I want an app and my phone vendor doesn't like my app or something, I, I, in other words, I can just download my app. You know. Yes, the it's only Android. Every every iPhone is completely limited by Apple, unless you jailbreak it. But I Android will let you do that. Hang on for a sec, Leo Laporte, the tech guy. I had to break, but uh, yeah, that. So you must have an, an iPhone. I've always had iPhones, and, yeah. uh, and, and 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 on the same basis, I like the phones. I just, in other words, I, I see this thing where uh, I assume it's every, it's all the phone guys, and I just don't want. I I I simply don't want my uh, on my phone vendor. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> so this is the. In fact, Apple's being sued. Uh, in a number of places, <laughs> including the U.S., oh, makes, over this. Well, no, this is Apple's uh, explanation. By control, entirely controlling the App Store, we make sure that you're safe, right? Although it's not a perfect thank system. You, thank you, exactly. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much. So, And then, and the, then Leo, and I was going to add Leo that. And in other words, I mean, some like... Uh, and then Tim Cook's plumber went to his house and decided <laughs> that he didn't like the content that Tim had on his Yeah, house. no, I agree with you. And, no, I completely no, and, agree and, with you. And then turned his water off. Uh, and in other words, uh, obviously, the, uh, you know, obviously, uh, right, then someone like Cook would simply go crazy, you know? So here's the deal. Um, there's no way around those restrictions on an iPhone. Any Android phone, any Android phone will let you do that. Now, let's say, take example, uh, Parler, which was the Twitter-like site that got banned by pretty much everybody, including, I might point out, Google from their Play Store, as well as Apple from their store. But the difference is, on an Android device, there's a checkbox in the settings that says, I want to get apps from somewhere else. And and you check that box. Now, they say, oh, be careful. Be careful. It's dangerous out there. And it's true. It is. Uh, so you want to only get apps that you know are safe. But then there is no restriction. As long as the company has made a an app, they can put it on their site and you can download it to your Android device. So, wow. so right. for yeah, Parler is a good exactly. example. If you go to Parler.com, they have an Android app. But you have to, it's called sideloading. You have to sideload it, which means you turn, you check that, they explain how to do it. You check that box, and then you can download directly from parlor.com their app, and then it's fully functional. So, wow. so that's the difference between, and that's a, probably the single most significant difference between Android and iOS. Well, Leo, thank you so much. You're such a genius. I love that. My I pleasure. Like nice to talk to you. I, I was hearing from other people that, that it was not possible that 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 that, 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 that your phone vendor could do. Uh, in other words, whoever had the equipment could do what they wanted, you know. Yeah, I mean, it is true on the iPhone, um, but that's the uh, signal difference between the iPhone and, uh, and Android. And if you're going to get an Android phone, you know, Samsung or Google both make excellent ones. I just got my daughter a Motorola uh, G9, which is a very inexpensive and fabulous Android phone. 200 bucks for the G9. Um, which version was it? Power, I think. But they're very inexpensive and they're great Android, pure Android devices. So there's a lot of good Android stuff out there. 
Um, it's weird because uh, Apple's really restrictive. Um, not in parlor is kind of the you know the the outlier, but there are apps that Apple prevents for merely having any political content or adult content, or you know they're very they're very funny about their store, and so they're in a little bit of trouble over all of that. Leo Laporte, the tech guy, 8888, ask Leo. Yeah, I got my daughter the uh, Moto G9 Power. Under 200 bucks. Under 200 bucks. Uh, and I think it's a nice, clean, pure Android experience. The best Android phone, probably, in my opinion, is the Google Pixel 5, the latest uh, from Google. It's a lot more expensive, closer to 1000 Um, And then, of course, Samsung's the number one phone manufacturer in Android world. Just got beat by Apple, though. They usually uh, are number one worldwide. But for the first time in many years, Apple is the number one phone manufacturer in the world in volume as well. You know, they've always been number one in revenue. Joe in Mission Viejo. Oh, I lost you, Joe. How about David in Laguna Beach? Hi, David. Hi, Leo. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I think I've got an easy one. I want to take it easy on Please, you. please, <laughs> please, please. <laughs> so I've caught the landscape photography bug, um, and I know sometimes you like to look up people's stuff, but I'm David Justin Photography, either .com or Instagram, whatever you want to look Well, up. you're pretty serious then. You're, 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 are you trying to make a living at this? Eventually, I would love to. I would love to, but uh, I just thought, you know, let's put it up somewhere so people oh, can see it. Family, family beautiful. members heard of you and stuff. Beautiful like images. Oh, you're Thank very you. talented. Well, I'm learning. I'm learning. Oh, I, I love am, them. I've got the Photoshop sickness, which is just like learning a foreign language. I'm still struggling, but Lightroom, I've I've got pretty good. Uh, my main problem is now I've got Dropbox, I've got Amazon, my Samsung <laughs> Fold 2. I just listened to full, the, the, the phone conversation. I got the Samsung Fold 2 just so I could have bigger pictures on my phone. So, uh, Why are you taking this very seriously? Is this, a yeah. sec is this a second career for you? Maybe. Maybe. If I, if I could get it going and, and figure out how to market it and sell them it's, at a reasonable I'll tell you rate. what. You're very talented. I love your images, but it's hard to make a living doing this, obviously. It really, yeah, really is. Yeah, yeah. It's a hobby right now, uh, but I would love to be the Peter Lick Jr., you know, yeah. for $10,000 yeah. a piece. Yeah. But, um, so what can yeah, I do I to help it. you? Is it storage? Is that to your consolidate? Yeah, yeah, I'm trying to consolidate. So if I go out and do a shoot and I come back and I plug my SD card into my laptop, now I've got them in Lightroom on the laptop. Then I I, I put it as a catalog I and know. I move it over. Now I'm thinking, okay, I'm on my main computer. Are those duplicates? Or are they not duplicates? <laughs> well, yeah. So then they've uploaded to the G Drive, and then Amazon wants, and now OneDrive. I don't even know what OneDrive is. So I I, I just <laughs> want to know: Can I create a NAS, I've got a Drobo, a four bay Drobo. You know what that is? Yes, I do. Um, to back everything up. The so, photographer's uh, friend. Yes, yes. But I, once I leave the house and somebody wants to see my photos, I don't know where to. You know, I mean, I guess. Well, your site is a great start. Uh, is this on Smug Mug? Where are you keeping your site? Yeah, Smug Mug is the site. David yeah. Justin Photography dot com is yeah. on Smug Mug, and then so the Sm Smug Mug, as you know, offers storage. Uh, you can even yeah. store your RAWs on Smug Mug, but that, that that'll add up because you're paying for it. Yeah, and I think right. they use Amazon Web Services to store those, as I remember. So I you've know. you've chosen a great place for your portfolio. I mean, okay, I'm I'm a big fan. Okay. This whole f workflow is challenging for all photographers. I'm going to refer you, my friend uh, Peter Krog, who's a very talented photographer and taught me a lot. The only thing he didn't teach me is how to be a good photographer. But everything else, <laughs> <laughs> That's nice. I can't blame him for, uh, for my talent, but uh, everything else. Right, right. He has a thing uh, that he did on photography workflow, certainly worth okay. looking at. Might be a little out of date now. It's a couple of years old. He did it with the Library of Congress and the American Society of Media Photographers. It's, it's dpbestflow.org. And it's actually a good place to look just to kind of see what people consider best practice. He, this is where I got the backup 
strategy I'm always talking about, one, two, three, yeah, backup. Yeah. But he does, right. but he talks about all kinds of issues in far greater detail. You, okay. The first thing you've got to decide is what is your dam? What is your, yeah. <laughs> your digital asset management tool? And if you're using Lightroom, yeah. that's probably the one to use. That's one yeah. of the most commonly used digital asset management tools. Lightroom keeps a catalog. Um, it can be a little fragile, so you should always be backing right. it up, as you know. Um, your catalog in Lightroom does not contain the images. So this right. is important. I know that. It will relocate yeah. images to an original image folder if you want, or you can leave them where you are. So the nice thing about Lightroom, and I think one of the reasons it's very popular, is you can say to Lightroom, don't move my images. I've got them organized. Right. I have them where I want, on a NAS or whatever, on the Drobo. You make right. a catalog... And as, and as long as you don't move those photos somewhere else, the catalog will always tie to the original. They even, Lightroom will still work with a thumbnail and put a little lo a logo, a little bug up saying, I've lost the original, you want to reconnect? And you can even move things around that way. So on, let me ask you a question about an, uh, like just a home NAS. Mine is wired. If it was wireless, it would just appear as a wireless network that my laptop could access or my iMac, yes. right? Because it's hardwired to my iMac. If it's what okay. So the, that's why we use network-attached storage. Drobo's yeah. network-attached solution is not as good, I think, as Synology's. That's so, I knew you were going to say Yeah, that. And, and that's what I use, and a lot of photographers yeah. use. So the reason, the difference is, that Drobo's connected like a USB drive to a single computer. Yep. But yep. if you get a NAS, you connect it to a router. You still want it hardwired, yeah. but you, you connect it to a router, and now every computer can see it. It's a shared drive. It's as if every computer oh, has access yeah. to it. Yeah, and yeah. it will, in the background, do backup automatically and so forth. And, in fact, the other reason to look at Synology is they actually have photo management software called Moments. Oh. Now, I'm not sure I'd recommend it, but um, yeah. it's worth taking a look at. They also I could access it from my laptop, yeah. from my maybe my phone. Yeah. Now, let me ask you this. If I was not home and someone says, hey, let me see some photographs, could I access that NAS for, like yes. an app? I could. Yeah. You can. Uh, in fact, that's a good reason to do that. The NAS can be made public. Now, you want to be very careful because now you're putting a server in, inside your network. It's so, basically a server. Yeah, it's a server. So you, but Synology has good tools for securing it. You're going to have to port forward on your router so that people can get into it. You can put a website on your Synology if you want. But uh, Moments, this program I've talked just about. Me, just for me. To show just for you. Yeah, yeah, I understand. Oh, a lot of photographers do that. You know, you do a, a wedding shoot. You want to show the bride yeah. the pictures. Yeah, uh, it's exactly. very common. So moments will also do that. There is an there. I'm very intrigued by their number of people, uh, mostly photographers, trying to address this. And there are other programs you can put on your Synology that are, might be better than Moments, but Moments is the one okay. Synology offers, and it has a shared photo library capability. Okay. It also has the yeah, face recognition, and it does a lot of the stuff that Google would do or Amazon does, but it does it locally and privately. Yeah, right. I mean, my stuff's just spread out over. So even, you know, sometimes I do take a, a shot with my phone if I'm stuck and they're not terrible. You know, maybe I edit it up and clean it up a little bit and, and maybe that goes in there. But now I've got them on my phone. I've got them in Google. I've got them in Amazon. I've got them in who knows where I now. Know. I just want them in one place. This is know? the universal uh, complaint of all photographers. I know. Uh, yeah. They just. And the duplicates. Don't even get me started. On yeah, them. they grow like Topsy. <laughs> uh, so it's a, it's a nightmare. So uh, I would, I would, there are some open source third party choices. There's one guy, and I can't remember the name of the software i'm trying to remember it but he's working very hard and what looks like it might be the best damn and when i say damn i mean digital mm -hmm. asset management yeah, uh, damn okay. tool out there uh i'll find the name and i'll put a link in the show notes it's free right now yeah, in open okay. source but i would but look at moments on the synology the thing about synology you can it can have almost infinite storage i have more than 32 terabytes on my, on my oh synology. my lord you're not going to oh, fill lord. that up no, I have four. I think they're, I think they're four terabytes each in my Drobo. I just figured I'll stick all, you know, all the same drives, get it all uniform. Yeah, I use a Drobo too, but it's a USB drive. Better as a USB yeah. external drive than as a network drive. And okay. For the network features, you need you need a NAS. Hold on a second. I got to take a break here, but I can keep talking to you off the air. I love talking to photographers. Well, sorry, Dave. I had to. 
No problem. I had, yeah, to, no, had I to run, as you know. Um, I figured out after about the third uh huh, and you were doing your thing. Uh huh, like, uh huh. <laughs> <laughs> what are you saying? What? what? He's doing his thing. I'm doing my thing, man. <laughs> I love your, I love your images. Really beautiful oh, stuff. Oh gosh, yeah. thank you. That means a lot. I, I guess you look a lot of images. I guess the thing at this point, you know, it, it's never too late to kind of come up with a, a strategy. Um, yeah. Chris Marquardt also has a really good book uh, on using Lightroom for uh, pr one of the Im issues I have is, you know, I'll take, uh, uh, you know, I'll go on a trip and come back with thousands of images, right? Yeah, and, of and, course. And one of the problems I have is processing those to narrow it down to the best images and so forth. And yeah. the, and I'm sure oh, you look like yeah. you've solved that. I love your uh, stuff on Smug Mug. But uh, Chris has a very good... Uh, let me see where I can find that. Is it on F Photos, uh, Sensei Photo? He has a very good, and I think it's free if you yeah, sign up for pulling, his newsletter. Pulling them down. It's on, cul it's a, yeah, it's called a th yeah. I think it's something like a thousand photos in an hour. And yeah. it's a really good system. He talks yeah. a, a lot about these kinds of uh, issues. So um, I'm yeah, going to. Yeah, he's I'll, good about it. Yeah, I'll see if I can find the. Uh, Thank you. Yeah, it's maybe it's just. Uh, in one hour, <laughs> um, one hour, one thousand picks. It's at shop.chrismarquart.com. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, that's good. Yeah. That's a good idea. One hour, one thousand yeah, picks. Uh, it's just one more thing. You know, you can get overwhelmed with all of this. I, yeah. Oh God, trust me. And my main thing lately, because I'm so paranoid about like deleting folders, or, or I'm like, okay, I'm just going to import it anyway, and we'll see. Yeah. And so, <laughs> Of 4,000 photos. Yeah. Like, yeah. 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 And you never, then you, but you need a system so that you don't get overwhelmed by those undeleted photos as well. Yeah. But right. I think the NAS is the way to go. Can I, can I move, like, is there, a, if I bought a Synology and they're not cheap, are they? I mean, what no. I, what I want a three bay or a four bay Synology? I'd like, get a five bay. Oh, really? Okay. Okay, so we're talking like at least five hundred bucks. Yeah, the, the yeah, because then you have to buy the drives. If you've got old drives lying lying around, you can use those. Um, can I port them over from Drobo? Can I? Well, how the hell would I do that? I gotta have. I, I can't do that because they're in the Drobo, right? I'd have to move them. No, the beauty them. part is you can connect the Drobo via the USB port on the Synology. And it, and it can import directly. So the first time you're going to copy directly, not going to copy over the network. You want the highest speed copy. Yes, yes. You can even, That's right. there's all sorts of ways to do that. You can even connect the Drobo okay. to your computer and do that. So yeah, that's I, the I first can, thing to do. I need drives. I need extra drives. Yeah, well, that's the thing. Now, you're, you're going to buy the enclosure, which is 500 bucks or more. Right. And then you got to put the drives in. Yeah, good times. So I think I spent a thousand on my Synology, but you know what? This okay. it's less than a camera no, lens. No, no question. Yeah, no question. Yeah, exactly. Right? Didn't we know that. That's problem. I just for that what? amount of money, I just bought. <laughs> I just bought the uh, Sony. Just uh, released a twenty millimeter f one eight, and yeah, perfect for yeah. landscape photography. What What do you usually That's shoot with? Beautiful. Right now, I'm a Canon guy, and I had the six D, which they're kind of very nice. Yeah, bargain a uh, full frame. Yeah. And then we're going to go to Yosemite in May, and I contacted uh, a guide there, like a wild wildlife guide. He goes, you need two bodies. And I was like, Absolutely. This, this trip's going to be four grand. Absolutely. Already. It's going to kill me. Absolutely. So I, I bought another, I bought the Mark II of the 6D Mark II. Perfect. I just can't, Perfect. you know. Yeah. I've got the camera on. you got the lenses. You spent all the money already on the glass. i got all the lenses. i got L glass. I'm like, I'm not going yeah. to the Canon R. I'm going to stay here and yeah. do it, you know. That's what's so keeping that's me away from the R is I don't, I already have a lot of L glass. I don't want to rebuy. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? Oh, God. My wife would divorce. You can use an adapter, but it's not. I know. Somebody told me you don't lose any light. I thought you did. No, I think that specifically for these, and then what's one of the advantages of mirrorless is that um, there's no, there's the lens is right against the sensor. So yeah, that's true. Adapters are pretty easy. Yeah, that's yeah. true. Well, thank you for the time, Leo. I hey, really a real pleasure. Thank look. you for the photos. They're beautiful. Thank you. I really appreciate it. that. Yeah, means a lot. Yeah, really nice. Have a great day. All right, Thanks you too. Great job. Take Thanks, care. Bud. Thanks. Take care. Well, hey, hey, hey. How are you today, Leo Laporte here? The tech guy. It's time to talk computers, the internet, home theater, digital photography, smartphones, smart watches, all that jazz. 8888 Ask Leo. We're going to talk space in half an hour. Rod Pyle will join us, but I'm going to get back to the phones. Again, the phone number 888 827 5555.
1-866-472-5837. 1-866-472-5837. That's toll-free from anywhere in the U.S. or Canada outside that area. You can still reach me. Just use Skype. And let me reiterate that we've talked a lot of links and a lot of suggestions and ideas and things and all of that stuff ends up uh, at the uh, website, which is techguylabs.com. Tech Guy, that's me, my labs with the beakers and the Bunsen burners and all that, and dot com. And uh, it's free. There's no sign up. Everything, uh, James Ruvo, our scribe, is writing it all down. It's all up there. Uh, in fact, we also put the audio and video from the show after the show, not during the show, but after the show, we put it up there, so you can know, you can watch the question, listen to the question, see the written answer, and add your own thoughts as well. That's all free. No sign up. TechGuyLabs.com. Let's go to Carson City, Nevada, and Tom. Hi, Tom. Hello. Welcome. Thank you. What can um, I do for you? Is, well, I have a. Acer 1470UR26 that turned into a doorstop. Oh, nuts. Oh, man. <laughs> I hate it when that what happens. What happened was it made some smoky smells, and Ooh. then the hard drive died. Okay. Now, would that make, make a good media server? And well, if you can get it working again, I don't know. <laughs> um, well, I can always change the hard drive. If you think that's what died, yeah, just change the hard drive. But it might not be what died. It might be something else inside. So you, you when you turn it on, what happens? Anything? Oh, it starts to load up, and then it gives me a blue screen. From Excellent. The then oh, you're right. God. Then it's just the hard drive. Um, the, a good way to test this, though, and I would recommend it before you spend any money you know, getting a new hard drive or whatever is to boot an operating system from a USB key or a USB drive just to see if everything's working. If it's just the hard drive broken, then that'll work fine. Um, you'll have to go into the setup and choose the boot order and you'll have to make a, a bootable operating system on a USB drive. The easiest thing to do is go to ubuntu.com and download a free copy of Linux. They explain how to burn that to a USB thumb drive, put it in there. And that way you can verify. In fact, you might even want to get the media server software. There's good Linux media server software out there. Um, but that will at least verify that the thing works, the keyboard works, the mouse works, that the whatever smoked was was not damaging to the whole computer, just to the hard drive. Smoking is not a good thing, <laughs> right? No, I opened it up. <laughs> I touched it with my hand. It was too hot to touch. Yeah, hard drive. so it could be that the, the circuit board on the hard drive fried, but if it's uh, the controller for the hard drive or something else, you want to know that before you put any more money into it. You know, does that make sense? Well, sure. Yeah. The hard drives don't cost much. I know, but but it, what would cost much is if you bought a hard drive and it didn't fix it. Then you go, oh, well, that was a waste of money. So it's up to you. I mean, but it's just my suggestion. It's not too hard to figure out if that's working. You can even download a copy of Windows. Even the, you know, the Windows installer, which you can get from Microsoft.com, search for Media Creation Tool. Put that on there and run it. You're not going to actually install Windows, but you're going to see that you can run it, that the keyboard works, that the mouse works, that the screen works. I'd hate to put any money into it if it's more than just the hard drive. If, you know, you want to take a chance, yeah, go out and get a hard drive. If it's a laptop, is it a laptop or a desktop? No, it's a box. It's a box. Okay, so it's easy enough to get into it and uh, swap out another uh, drive. You've already opened it up to see it smoking. So, well, I, yeah, it was hot to the touch. Yeah. The well, drive. hard drives are hot to the touch normally. That's not necessarily the problem. So, and by the way, this might be a good chance. It depends what you want to do. As you said, a media server then you might want to get a less expensive hard drive because you can get lots of capacity for, or even we were just looking at one that's eight terabytes for 150 bucks. Media servers need a lot of storage. Movies are big. Uh, if speed and performance is the issue, then you want maybe to get a smaller SSD. Um, that just depends on how you're going to use it. But if it's a media server, yeah, probably a, a spinning disc would be just fine. Have fun. It's a good project. Clyde, Torrance, California, Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hello. Hey, Clyde. Yeah, I'm on. Uh, I am replacing my 12-year-old home theater. You got any suggestions? I have a small room. I only need a 5.1. I can take it wired or I can take it uh, um, 
You know, what are you the, getting the you getting the TV the set, the sound you're doing the whole thing? Well, no, the TV is is a Vizio. I don't think it'll ever break down. Yeah, good. So you're gonna you have a TV. You just want to get the surround sound. Yeah, I need to get a new unit. Right. So the e do you have a budget? Uh, well, you know we can. <laughs> I'm buying a new car this week, so it'll be a little tight. <laughs> All right. So uh, I, you already have a Vizio TV. You're happy with it. Vizio also makes uh, sound bars and home theater systems. So the easiest way to add a surround sound to a system is to get a sound bar, which is a long speaker that's the width of the TV, goes underneath or above the TV. And then... You can get additional speakers. For instance, uh, Vizio, the M series 5.1 has a sound bar. It's got a subwoofer for the low, the big bass low notes. And it's got two surround speakers to go back by your ears. That's going to, without a lot of work and without a lot of money, this is only 350 bucks. that's going to give you a very nice surround sound. Of course, you know, you want a home you know, brilliant home theater, you can you can spend thousands of dollars on all that. It just that's why I asked you your budget. It just depends on what your needs and your budget are. But I would start by taking a look at the Vizio uh, sound bars. They have, I think they're and Scott Wilkinson, by the way, our home theater guy, uh, completely agrees with me. In fact, I think it's probably where I got the idea. They have a very good variety of uh, choices. You can even get Dolby Atmos, which means that the speakers fire up as well and so you're getting surround not only left and right back and forward forward but also above you so there's some very good choices and they range from 250 bucks to a uh, thousand bucks so there's quite a bit uh, of choices if you go to vizio.com you can at least look at the variety of, of uh, choices the the, okay. Yeah. Uh, you know, everything I've looked, I can't go shopping right now. I know. You, you're going to have to trust me and Scott on the sound quality. Yeah. Yeah. Now, and uh, everything I've seen online is an AV receiver, and there's not much advantage to that. The sound, the advantage of the sound bar is it just plugs into your TV, drives the whole thing. You don't need an AV receiver. Yeah. The advantage of an AV receiver, and I use an AV receiver, is you can have multiple inputs. So, I, I mean, I'll tell you what my surround sound system is, and I'm talking maybe two or three thousand dollars. So I have a, a Denon. AV receiver, which has seven inputs. And I need that because I'm always trying stuff. The Fire TV, the Apple TV, the Roku, the cable box. You know, you, pretty quickly you find a lot of HDMI inputs to that TV. And then it has one output that goes up to the TV, which is nice. So I can control what thing I'm looking at on, this, on the AV receiver. And then the AV receiver is connected to the 5.1 surround sound. I have a giant sub... I bought speakers from a company that makes, I think, very good speakers uh, uh, at a fairly affordable price, ELAC, ELAC. But these are all unpowered speakers, so you need the AV receiver to power the speakers. The AV receiver has enough juice to drive a big old subwoofer. Actually, it has its own power because subwoofers use so much juice. The left and right channel, the center channel, which on my home system is above the TV. It can be above or below, but it needs to be where the, in the middle of the screen roughly is, uh, above it or below it, So that's because that's where voices come from. And then two left and right surrounds. So that's a, what they call a 5.1 system. There's 7.1, which has additional surrounds behind you, uh, there's Atmos, which has additional either speakers above you or speakers that fire up and bounce off the flat ceiling, as long as your ceiling isn't acoustically, uh, you know, uh, tiled or uh, or tilted or canted, you can do that. Um, so you can see there's a lot that goes to this. I think honestly, look at the M series. It's a it's nice. It's inexpensive. It gives you great sound. I think for most people. Because it's wireless, you don't need an AV receiver. It's a it's a it's a really good choice. It's it's kind of up to how crazy you want to get. I got crazy. What can I say? Uh, you know, I kind of I kind of <laughs> I busted the budget on it. Uh, but I love it. And when we turn it up, it makes the walls vibrate, which is an interesting effect. Eighty-eight, eighty-eight. Ask Leo. Our spaceman is coming up. Patricia on the line from Santa Barbara, California. Hello, Patricia. Hello. Hello. Hi, Leo. Ah, hello, Patricia. How are you? 
I'm good. Um, I live up here, but I'm in a gallery in San Diego, and I'm not a techie, but I volunteered to buy a set of cameras and a, and a monitor. Uh, and in our back room of our gallery, we have a Dell computer, and our idea is not to run tape or anything to look at it particularly later, if we get something stolen. So these are security. You want to set up a security system, basically. Yes, for the daytime, but we want the monitor to uh, sort of be, sort of speaking, in the customer's face when they come in so we know <laughs> that they're being surveilled. Like a fancy jewelry store, right? Yeah. Yeah. Buzz them in. They're on camera. You can put a big sign up, says, smile, you're on camera. That's right. Candy yeah. camera. Do you, get, do you have a lot of theft we, in the gallery? People stealing stuff from you? Yes, we've had some theft oh, jewelry. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, it's, a, oh, it's got I jewelry. Oh. The problem is we I can buy like two to four cameras, but Wi-Fi, um, we need continuous motion if that were available, a capture time. You know, a lot of them run the capture motion for 10 or 12 seconds, and that's... That's it. My suggestion, I can tell you some products and so forth, but honestly, I would suggest that you get somebody to come in and set this up for you. We, pr I probably would, but I want to um, try to figure out what to you, buy. You want to know ahead of time, yeah. yeah and so possible. if you call if you call a company, they will probably have stuff that they use. Here's what you're going to want. What uh, kind of company do I call? I'm not a geek. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if you just look up security cameras, you'll find quite a few companies that, uh, that well, put I those have, in. Okay. But they're okay. hard. the companies are hard to reach to even ask questions. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, don't get one that's hard to reach. <laughs> that's not a good, <laughs> that's a bad start. Yeah. Yeah. But there are a lot of, uh, I, I'm not familiar with what's in the Santa Barbara area, but there are a no, lot no. of companies that do this this is not an unusual thing to do oh, no this would be san diego area oh san diego you said that's mm -hmm. right yeah yeah but um the thing is we even looked at i even looked at baby monitors which kind of capture motion and you don't have to really look at a tape later but um, no don't go with a baby monitor so here's the yeah. th here's the what you monitor's too tiny many alarm companies will do this as well for you so here's i, I do suggest a, a professional come in and wire it and set it up it'll be a lot easier for you we have a very similar system we used to when we had people come in a studio we'd have a armed guard sitting there at the front he was a pussy cat but he looked scary <laughs> and he had a monitor just exactly what you're talking about with uh, eight eight pictures in there kind of rotating and you want them live so you can see what's going on. Yes. And, uh, and the way we did that. Yeah. Well, you don't want Wi-Fi. You want, probably you want wired. You could do it over Wi-Fi. No, we really can't in, in our particular gallery, um, because there's not enough outlets. I mean, my budget, I'm doing this, uh, volunteering to buy this. So oh my, you're a very nice person. Okay. <laughs> uh, uh, okay. Um, so there are cameras that you're going to have to plug it in. You understand that, right? You, you want something that has no wires? Right. In other words, they run off batteries. Okay. Yeah, there are such a things, but those don't stream continuously or the batteries okay. would die instantly. They only stream continuously. If, if there's movement. Plugging. When there's movement, they go, oh, and they wake up. Uh, I would go... So, yeah, you probably, given that you're paying for this, you're not going to get an installer to do this. I understand that. Um, I would take a look at a company called Wise. I've referred that people. I have. Okay. W-Y-Z-E.com. Uh -huh. They have exactly that kind of camera. They're wireless Wi-Fi cameras. What's nice is right. they do have uh, room for you to put a little memory card in there, which means they can do continuous recording if you put that card in. In the computer. Yeah, but that's going to be, yeah. no, 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 in the camera. But that's going to be oh. after the fact. You don't, you're not going to see, see it all the time. But the nice thing about the Wise Cams, they start at $20 per camera. No, I want to spend, I mean, I can spend up to a couple hundred. For no, I understand, it. but that's just the beginning. 
<laughs> yeah. Right. Okay. So let's, you know, uh, let's not go crazy here. <laughs> let's not go crazy. Um, and the wise cams, because they're not live, you're not going to have that thing you want, which is the, the continuous, continuous motion. motion, eight pictures to scare the bad guys away. That's not going to be doing that. Yeah. So there's exactly. no real good way to monitor the wise cameras. You're going to want, I mean, I tell you what I would do, but it's going to cost you a little more. Um, tell me and I'll write it down. Okay. There's a company called Ubiquity, U-B-I-Q-U-I-T-I. -I. If you okay. search for Ubiquity security cameras. Okay. But, but these aren't wireless. So you, okay. you have to decide, do you want this continuous video presence that people can see themselves moving on it or... Do you want something with no wires? You can't do both. Okay. Yes, I realize. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, wired, uh, these have just one wire. It's an Ethernet wire that powers them. That okay. will plug into a box. So you run a wire to the back of the store, plugs into a box. Then it will stream live. So okay. if you search for Ubiquity security cameras... Okay. You'll see how they can do this, but I don't know how inexpensive this is going to end up being. These are, these kinds of cameras are hundreds of dollars each. Mm. So that's the difference. The Wise cameras are a simple setup. You put them in there. If there's motion, it'll pop up on your phone. You can't monitor it because it doesn't do a continuous stream. You can record continuously, but you can only look at it the after the fact. Leo Laporte, the tech guy, coming up. Rocket Man, stay right here. You can trigger them, but she wants you could. So, so as soon as you open it on the phone, it, it turns it on, but it's not on all the time. Oh, okay. That's always on. So with Cam Plus, and and which Wise cameras does that work with? All of them. Yeah. All right. Well, I'll mention this. I'll mention this to her. Um, the Wise Cam V3. You don't have to, is it battery powered? Yeah. <laughs> she, her expectations were a, a little mismatched from what she could do. Yeah, she wanted a battery powered continuous streaming system, which I don't think you can do. You could do the wise cam and then whenever, I don't know. Yeah, why is if, if she's, there's an incident and she wants to go back and review. But what she wants is a, a monitor that's sitting in the store that when you come in the store, you go, oh, I'm on camera. You know how these security systems lurk. And that's much more uh, expensive, I think. That The ubiquities would be great for that. Um, but that's going to take wires and all that. And again, I think you you really there's no cheap, easy way to do this. I don't think. I'm looking at the Lorex. Actually, it's not loading because you're all looking at it now. <laughs> Finally loaded. Four okay, sixteen ninety nine, four K, eight four K nocturnal very focal zoom cameras. These are not battery, are they? No way! These are these are battery. <laughs> this is nice. <laughs> this doesn't meet the requirements. <laughs> Great choice! I love it. I mean, I could. I mean, I can come up with hundreds of these kinds of systems. This is this is more what she wants, but she does, she said she wanted battery, which you know. This will this will show you the probably the uh, pictures and everything. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Time for our rocket man, Mr. Rod Pyle, author of many books about space, including his latest Space 2.0. He's also the editor in chief of Ad Astra, the magazine of the uh, National Space Society, and I've got all his books here and the magazines and everything, and uh, it's great to talk to you once again, Rod, from your boat in beautiful San Diego Harbor. It is indeed. How are you? I'm great. Today, Good. now everybody's saying you're going to talk about Mars. We talked about Mars. There's nothing more to say for a little while. Mars will get exciting in a couple of weeks 
when the rover starts doing stuff and the helicopter takes off, and we'll talk about it then. But I think that what you want to talk about today, Rod, might be more uh, interesting for the moment. <laughs> What's going on? Well, it, it's potentially worrisome in, in many, many years. So uh, on March 21st, we have a big asteroid flying past the orbit of Earth. It's called 2001 FO32. But it's going to be thousands and of miles away, right? Well, more than that. So so what you're going to see in headlines is, oh, my God, it's the width of the main span of the Golden Gate Bridge. It's 5,000 feet across and that's all big. that stuff. Oh, yeah. And that's a big problem. Yeah. But it's going to pass us of a dis at a distance of about 1.3 million miles or five times the moon's orbit. And people don't really get nervous until it starts cutting inside the distance of the moon's orbit. But it is classified as potentially hazardous by JPL and the Air Force. So it is something to keep an eye on. Uh, it'll be passing at a speed of about 77,000 miles per hour. Ooh. And at that speed and that size, that's about 100,000 megatons worth of rock slamming into the planet. So we do want to start looking at ways, and NASA is uh, launching a mission. Yeah, in we got to get Bruce Willis in a rocket or something. We got to get Well, going. exactly. Yeah. I'm looking I mean, really, JP, all they have to do. JPL has this great page. Uh, yeah. Of uh, of the next five asteroids. <laughs> right. <laughs> scary, and, isn't and it? Scary. There's uh, one the it's size a look of out a, below moment there. Yeah. One's the yeah. size of an airplane, but it's three million miles away. One's the size of a, 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 a skyscraper, but it's three million miles away. But this one they say is stadium sized. And, yeah. And uh, getting a little closer than we like. So what yeah. do we plan to do if one of these things comes really close? Well, there's a couple of steps. The Obama administration increased the budget for detecting and dealing with these things, at least research for that, by about 10 times back in 2010. Is that because of the movie is or is that because we really nah. need it? Nah. No. Okay. It's just because we know we really need it because we're overdue statistically for a major collision. What so is, the trick so, is... So, so asteroids have hit us in the past. Yeah. And what yeah. happened? <laughs> Talk to the dinosaurs. <laughs> well, there was one in... In uh, 1908, called the Tunguska event, which took out hundreds of square miles of forest, and that wasn't nearly as big as the one we're talking about. Wow. And then, of course, there was one in Russia in 2013, which is the size, the, the energy release was the size of a small nuclear bomb. But the trick is you want to get orbiting telescopes up to be able to detect them further out, because the further out you find them, the less energy and technology it takes to divert them. Because if they're far enough away, you remember your geometry from high school, you just nudge them a little bit and you set them off track and they're, they're not going to come to Earth. Yeah. So there's a program going up in 2025 uh, called DART, the Double Asteroid Redirection Test, which I think we talked about once. Uh, it's an asteroid called Didymos, and it's got a littler uh, rock orbiting it, actually, called Diddy Moon. That, at least that's the the, <laughs> the cute name they use. It sounds like a rap So this star. is an ion thruster <laughs> spacecraft, and the spacecraft is basically just a, a chunk of mass. I mean, it's got instruments on it, but the idea is they're going to slam this 1,000-pound spacecraft into the smaller rock, which is about uh, 500 Nudge. feet across. Nudge it a little bit. And then... Yeah, and then send another mission out to see how much it diverted it. And if that works, then we start building bigger ones so we'll be able to catch these things in the future. But, yeah, the dinosaurs have a very poor opinion of that asteroid <laughs> that hit them. It was bigger, but it's only about six six to eight times bigger than the one that we're tracking. And the one that we're talking about here is one of the largest ones that they wow. know of that's a near-Earth object. So, so, yeah, it's something to be aware of. What, so if something hits of that size... Uh, is well, I mean, is like a nuclear bomb. Is it? What is it? What would the impact? I've seen a few movies, but those are movies. What really would happen? Yeah, those are movies. So there was a Russian weapon called Tsar Bomba back in the 1960s. They tested it was the largest nuke ever exploded in the open, and it was about 100,000 megatons. So this would be about that much energy. So it's a small. It would kill either a large county or a small city. Okay. Crater would be between 8 and 14 miles across. But the chances are it hit, it hit the water, miles. right? I mean, Earth is mostly water. Well, you know, what we'd really like it to do is hit in the Australian outback or the great deserts of the U.S. or something. Because if it hit the water, you could have a tsunami up to about oh, 160 feet tall, that which would is be even good. worse, right? Okay, okay. Yeah. yeah. So the effects would be roughly equivalent to a large volcanic eruption. So we'd have some crop failures. But you could, you know, up between... If it hit in the wrong place, 
like in a really densely populated area, you could have 30 or 60 million dead. So it's something we really want to pay attention to and start working on. And there's a lot of methods besides, you know, kinetic impactors like the thing I'm talking about with DART. There's been uh, discussions of using a nuclear weapon not to blow up the rock because that just makes a bunch of smaller rocks, which can be just as bad, but to <laughs> blow it off to one side so you nudge the thing off course. They've even talked about, for smaller ones, spray painting one side white so the thermal difference between the light side and the dark side causes it to uh, actually deflect off course because of the radiation acting wow, as a propellant. So there's a clever. lot of ways they're looking at it. That's Just, yeah. paint, just paint one side of it. That's all. and. Or attach rocket engines and just divert it. But the trick is to find it early enough and predict its track and say, okay, this is serious. We've got to get out there and deal with it. Yeah. You need a tow truck, you know? <laughs> so what did Bruce Willis do? Did he blow it up? I don't remember in Armageddon. Yeah, all the movies, they, you know, set nuclear devices. And then I think that was the, there was two of those movies. There was uh, the Bruce Willis one and the other one. Which Probably Nicholas Cage remember, but, or somebody. Uh, yeah, and you know somebody always has to stay behind because the detonator won't work, <laughs> and many tears are shed in Mission Control and all that. But you know, let's use robots. They're really smart, and we yeah, don't we care don't if they send get blown people. Apart, right? We don't have to send even right. washed-up movie stars. We could send robots, and that'd be plenty. Deep Impact. That was the other one. Deep Impact. Well, actually, there's there's a few washed-up movie stars. We wouldn't mind sending. But that's yeah. un, that's uncharitable. Yeah. <laughs> Don't say that. Well, but no radio personalities, okay? So it's hard to tell because of the movies if this is a real threat. Uh, I mean, it you know, we've survived so far. Um, right. Well, so statistically, we're overdue for a moderate size impact, um, but these are statistics. Right. You know, so they're only good up until the afternoon the thing actually comes cruising in the atmosphere, yeah. and then your statistics much, are shot. How much warning would we have? It depends on the size of the rock, its brightness. Most of them are very dark, and if we're scanning that direction at the right time. So probably many years, um, possibly many months, at least that much for a big one. Yeah. But like that one in Chelyabinsk, that was only 60 feet across, but it wasn't spotted at all until it was right on us. Right. So uh, they, don't, they don't spot them all. You know? But the big ones, they think they've charted 95% of the really large, dangerous ones. So for those, we know generally where they're going and what's going to happen, unless they collide with something and get knocked off course, of course, which is so, also bad. But that's unlikely. Armageddon and Deep Impact both came out in the same year, the in the same summer. Uh, Armageddon yeah. fared better at the box office, but astronomers said Deep Impact was more scientifically accurate. Uh, both of them scored under 50% on Rotten Tomatoes. So, <laughs> Which is a good metric to follow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I'm not, and now there's a new one called Greenland that came out just a few I'm, months I ago. I want to watch that one. Seen yet. Yeah, I, I want to watch yeah, that well, also it's an asteroid? It's down to $6 now. Oh, all right. I, it's, uh, it's either an asteroid or a comet. And it was 20 bucks when it premiered, but now it's down to 6 Probably not worth So that's bucks. worth it. Yeah. That's no, Rod, but I think it's worth 6 Rod Pyle, if you want to know more, space.nss.org. Uh, always a pleasure to talk to you, Rod. And let Thanks, us know Leo. if a big one's coming, okay? Will you, will you give us a I will up? do. Thank you. We appreciate <laughs> it. Absolutely. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Thank you for letting me be your tech guy today. Leo Laporte, the tech guy, thank you so much for letting me uh, spend some time with you today. I hope you enjoyed it. I certainly did. Thanks to our uh, musical director, Professor Laura. She's so good at finding just the right song at just the right moment. Thank you, Laura. Thanks also to Kim Schaffer, who answers all the phone calls and gets them on the air and preps them and so forth. Our phone angel, thanks to all of you for listening. I uh, couldn't do it without you. I mean, I'd have to talk for three hours. That would, that would be no fun for anybody. Uh, last segment of the show, so let's see what we can do here. With Starting off with Alan in Murrieta, California. Hello, Alan. Leo, how are you, my friend? Wonderful. How are you, my friend? I'm doing great. I'm doing great. Uh, I was listening with some interest to the woman who wanted to have wireless cameras. Yeah, I was a little frustrated because <laughs> she she had what she wanted. I understood what she wanted, but she, I don't think she could do what she wanted with the, lim uh, the limitations. Know, some, sometimes the uninformed think that all things are possible. Magic. Technology is magic. <laughs> yeah, well, and ultimately, if you're going to put a system like that in and you want it to be reliable, I mean, I, we didn't install our system here. We, we, we had somebody do it, and they did a great job. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, she should tr- she should trust talking to a salesperson, and if she can't get anybody to call her back, there's something seriously wrong. <laughs> yeah, that's not a that's not a good sign. I would not do business with whoever that is. That seems. I mean, seems... I'm in I'm in I'm in Murrieta, and I do this kind of stuff. And oh, I do would, you? Uh, say, Give me your number, I'll call her. You well, know? what would you what would you tell her? I would tell her I would go with like a POE system. Yeah, a wire going back to an NBR. Yep. Or, or even if you want to do step down, we can go, you know, on a coaxial based system. Um, You're gonna have to have wires to do what she wants yeah, to do. Yeah, absolutely. You, 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 you can't go. You can't do anything else. I mean, it's like, yeah, you can. You know, if you want to sit there and pull the cameras down every night and plug them into a charger, you'll be sorry. Not, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you will. You will. You can do it. You will regret it. Yeah, that's unfortunate. Exactly. Yeah. Um, that's not the reason I called. Okay, but I thank you for the for the reinforcement because I I I, <laughs> I, 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 I didn't want to. I'm laughing. I yeah. wanted to give her an answer that would work for her. Um, and POE, which is power over Ethernet, is probably the simplest way because you get high-speed data and power one little cable. Um, yeah. That yeah. seems like the you best know, way to go. It, you know, it, it sounds like it's real easy, one little cable, but when you're configuring a PO, you know, a... Uh, IP system. I know. That'd be a little daunting. Yeah, That'd that's be a little daunting. That's why I said you should call somebody like Alan. Um, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Maybe I should be a sponsor. <laughs> <laughs> the chat room recommended something from a company called Lorex. I don't know if you're familiar with L O R E X. Lorex is is originally FLIR. Oh, okay. Uh, it's kind of the consumer grade stuff, uh, kind of in the I call it the the lower echelon of equipment. So its specialty would be night vi night vision. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. You know, she if she wants something that that you know protecting her valuable artwork. I mean, you, you know, you spend some money and you get some cameras with some uh, you know decent megapixels to it that'll yeah. that'll you know give some good resolution. Yeah, that's the other problem. But, of course, you're gonna you're gonna need yeah. a good camera as well as then yeah. of course the good resolution, good camera. That means a lot of bandwidth. That means a wire. I'm sorry to say. Oh, uh, yeah, it, it does. But anyhow, so my problem is with iDrive. Now, I've had it for over a year now. We should mention a sponsor of the show, yeah. just for a disclaimer. sponsor of the show, yep. yes. Um, and I am not an employee of iDrive, nor of... Uh, <laughs> of the Premier Radio <laughs> Network or Leo Laporte. Thank Go you. ahead, yes. Thank I've, you. We have good. never met... In Oh, no, we have we have met. we have met. Never mind. Forget I said that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that was another phone call. Okay. Um, anyhow, recently on the iDrive, I've been getting these error message that said password mismatch, uh. and I and I sent a uh, uh, I opened a ticket with them, and they said, well, you need to download a, a new version of the uh, of the software. Now, what's funny is I went to their site, iDrive.com, and my browser does absolutely nothing. It just parks there and looks stupid. And I know that my browser's working because all my other pages that I go to are all open and they're all happy and talking to me. But this one, whenever I put in, uh, whenever I put in the... Uh, Did you get a blank the, uh, screen? No, I don't get a blank screen. I get, I, well, I, the screen is blank, but I don't even get a message. A 404, I get nothing. Which so, is weird. It is weird. I just went to iDrive.com, and, of course, it popped right up. I have to say, I have seen this. In fact, it just happened to me. Uh, during the show, I went to a site, and I got a completely blank page. And right. I think this is happening more often. It's happening to me more often. Maybe you, and I think it's because of security software. Tracker blockers on our browsers, ad blockers. Uh, security software, maybe even network-wide security software. More and more, it's my opinion because I've seen this too, and I, I don't. I, I drive is fine for me, but I think the first thing I would look at if I were you, and I'm guessing, given your profession, that you probably do have some security stuff running in the I, background. I, I have some. I do, I do have ad blocker, but I I, uh, I believe I thought I went in this morning to disable it, but I'll have to go back and look. I, I even went on to a different browser i went to safari yeah i've done look at this has happened to me too and it's local to you is i guess what i'm saying if it, if i drive yeah. we're not yeah. coming up i think i'd be hearing it and i just did it and it's working for me so right but the thing is i think this does happen and it's not just i drive i think it does happen i think increasingly uh we're, we're we're getting a problem where sites are trying more and more 
to know more and more about you as you visit them. And then uh, the blockers on your browser, uh, on your system, on your network are all fighting them. And I think sometimes I get, uh, I got just today, I was weird, a blank page on a website. Other people are looking at the website. It's okay for them. I only no. only can think it's something local to your configuration and your setup. What's, what's interesting is I tried it on my iPhone and the same thing happened. Well, now the one thing in common then is your network. Is the router. Yeah. Uh, try here. Here's the, the way to try that. Turn off Wi-Fi on your iPhone and see if you can pull the site up. Ah, uh, that's a good point. Yeah. Now I yeah, have to say, even, I run. Even if I even if I get it, I need to put it on my Mac, not my uh, not my iPhone. Yeah, I understand. But then at least you know that it's something that your network is doing to block it, as yeah, opposed to that's true. Uh, generally. This is a this is a tough one uh, to solve. I use uh, and I've recommended many times something called Next DNS at nextdns.io which uh, does both privacy ad blocking and malware blocking. But I often find that I have to turn it off if I'm going to visit a site. There's there's lots of things that can go wrong. And I don't I don't think it's your fault. I don't think it's iDrive's fault. I think we're living in a world now where we're kind of at war with each other. Uh -huh. my, yeah. friend, my friend Corey Doctorow uh, calls this the largest uh, consumer boycott in history the widespread use of ad blockers. You know, consumers are just saying, look, I'm not going to go to your page. It's got too many dancing monkeys. I don't want to see all that. It's not, it's, it's, it's an insecurity problem. Uh, I don't, I don't want to go there. And there, and as a result, they're opting out. And then of course you've seen it. I'm sure you go to a page and says, well, you can't look at this page. You've got an ad blocker running. <laughs> and yeah. Yeah. I've seen that. I've seen that yeah. If you've seen that, then that means, yeah, you've got some network security. I would, that's where I would go to look at it. I, obviously if iDrive isn't working, the website isn't working, I'd hear about it. I know I'd hear it. The chat room would be telling me. Well, I, went, I went and I checked. I guess there was there was a website I went to that you can check and see if a website is down and it said, no, it's healthy. It's yeah. there. Yeah. So I knew, and, and the fact that everything else, you know, uh, on my browser was was happy and functioning. Uh, there's some mismatch. My, there's something that, phone. yeah, there's something they're doing on the iDrive site that your security software has decided, nuh uh you're not you're not coming in here, and uh, honestly, I think this happens more and more. I really think this is uh, we're we're coming to a head on this one. There's something something's got to give, because sites want to monetize. I understand that they need to show ads, they don't need to spy on us. I think that's a mistake, uh, and I'm not saying iDrive's doing that, but uh, you know, I don't blame consumers for opting out, but we've got to we've got to solve this somehow. So try 148. <laughs> Let's see if it's a DNS error. We can do that. Are you still on the line, Alan? Yeah, uh, I'm here. Let I'm me. Here. Let's try the uh, IP address. You ready? Uh, yeah, go <laughs> you got a browser in front of you. One forty-eight. Uh, no, I'm actually uh, in my storage. Oh, all right. Well, and the other one is you could uh, you could run. There's you know this because you're a geek. There's there's tools like a DNS lookup you could run to see if there's uh -huh. a DNS issue. Yeah. But what I would try to do is get the IP the the literal IP address and try that. If there is a DNS uh -huh. issue, you'll go straight to the site. Okay. And I I have it in front of me, but that's not going to be any good to you until you get home. No, no, no. That's okay. That's all right. Yeah. No. That's a weird. Yeah. It's a weird issue, but I have to think. You know, it's it's specific to something about your configuration. And, boy, the easy way to find out is turn off Wi-Fi and just use your cell, cell network. Yeah, I'll see if that works. It wouldn't work for me because I run DNS, uh, next DNS on my phones, and it inter intercepts everything, including cell traffic, because okay. I, I don't want cell, site, cell uh, providers to be spying on me either. There you so. go. Yeah. Well, hey, uh, thank you. I expect to hear back from them, uh, but because I, you know, I responded to their ticket, so good. Uh, You'll hear back from them. Okay. And if you do have any problems, just email me, Leo at uh, TechGuyLabs.com, and I will I will intercede. And you'll come on down and help me. That's I will help you, Alan. <laughs> as long as you go down in San Diego and help that lady with the gallery, we're all good. Hey, Noah, for, for, for if there's a check involved, I'll be there. <laughs> I'm really glad you called because I didn't want to say anything mean uh you no, know yeah. 
but it's people are running people are running for it's just that's why i, I kind of yeah. said you need to talk to an installer and and, and see yeah, what, so what's doable even if You're even better. if you still want somebody to install this you don't want to do this yourself it's just not worth no, it no 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 and there's plenty and i've seen what people do themselves you yeah, know and yeah. it's a horror show yeah so yeah. you know anyhow have a nice rest of your sunday sir thank you very much you too alan and <laughs> take care bye-bye all right take care bye well, that's it for the Tech Guy Show for today. Thank you so much for being here. And don't forget, TWIT, T-W-I-T. It stands for This Week at Tech, and you'll find it at twit.tv, including the podcasts for this show. We talk about Windows on Windows Weekly, Macintosh on Mac Break Weekly, iPads, iPhones, Apple Watches on iOS Today, Security on Security Now. I mean, I can go on and on and on. And, of course, the big show every Sunday afternoon, This Week in Tech. You'll find it all at twit.tv. And I'll be back next week with another great Tech Guys show. Thanks for joining me. We'll see you next time.